I don't think Chuck is here. I can go ask him. Chuck's not here. Um, that's Julia Bradley and Bob Donovan. Chuck wasn't able to make it. All right, it is actually 7.01. I'm going to call this meeting to order. And Dr. Midzik, has this meeting been posted? Yes, it has. Okay, and roll call will show that all five board members are present along with our two student board members. We will start with the pledge and welcome to everybody here tonight, too. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Well, we have a packed house tonight, and I know it's because everyone wants to hear about the school district in here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I want to welcome all of our guests tonight. We have several commendations. I'm going to let Dr. Midzik start with them. And uh, again, I want to welcome everyone to the school board meeting tonight. So the first commendations we have are for national merit finalists. The M. The NMSC uses the PSAT and the NMSQT as the initial screener for over 1.5 million entrants into the program. Semifinalist recogni recognizes about 16,000 of the 50,000 are recognized as National Merit semifinalists in this process. Those making semifinalists, about 34 of the 34,000, no, 34 of the 50, or about 3 to 4 percent of all PSAT. PSAT takers are commended and receive a letter of commendation. They do not continue to the competition for merit scholarship awards. Finalist rec recognition is approximately 15 of the 16,000 semifinalists advanced to finalist standing. They must also submit an application that includes high school courses and grades, extracurricular activities and volunteer activities, and a self-descriptive essay. The information that is collected about each semifinalist is later used in the process to choose scholarship winners. All finalists receive a certificate of merit in recognition of their outstanding performance in the competition. Scholarships are 15,000 finalists. Of the 15,000 finalists, about 8,000 receive merit scholarship awards. And we have three that were recognized from Greendale High School that are here this evening. The first that I'd like to recognize is Tyler Bellotta. Uh, he... <clears throat> Tyler enjoys learning on a deep level how electronics and computers work, building circuits that can do a variety of really cool things and seeing them do what he made them do. It's like a physical version of programming, which makes it really enjoyable. And he enjoys the robotics activity, which he is on our first robotic team. Uh, 
First, during the off-season, there's a great deal of outreach to the community, helping out with various events and spreading STEM and robotics to the community. Second, during the build season, they take ideas and turn them into physical robots that can drive around. Uh, one thing he's particularly proud of for this year's robot is the shooter. It can shoot a giant foam ring, this year's game piece, into a goal up to, from up to 14.5 feet away, automatically adjusting its angle so it makes it every time. He also enjoys the competitions. Each one is a three-day-long event where 40 to 70 teams bring their robots, and they had a competition this weekend, and I know they're already making improvements for the next one. Uh, and he plans to major in computer science. He's currently committed to the University of Tulsa in Oklahoma. After graduating, he would like to pursue a PhD in computer science. That is Tyler Bolado. We'll do them one. We'll do all three of them together. Okay. The second of our national merit final national merit scholarship winners is um, Charlie Smitsdorf. Charlie, in addition to being a national merit finalist. <laughs> In addition to being a National Merit Finalist, Charlie also earned the highest possible ACT composite score of 36. Only 1% of all test takers earn the top score. Among U.S. high school graduates in the class of 2023, just 2,542 out of more than 1.39 million students who took the test earned a composite score of 36. So that's quite an accomplishment. Um, Charlie also enjoys engineering. Good job, Charlie. He also enjoys engineering and the design aspects of the class, especially the current project of building and programming the marble sorter. And he also competes with our first robotics team. He's been on the GHS robotics team for four years and this year serves as the team captain. He enjoys the hands-on engineering and programming experiences as well um, as the business skills of leadership and teamwork and technical writing. Charlie has not yet committed to a school. Top choices are Rose Holman, in Northwestern with a major in engineering, physics, or mechanical engineering, and he hopes to eventually get a master's degree or a PhD as well. And our final national merit uh, finalist is Adriana Kelly, who I've known for quite some time. <laughs> she is a woman of few words, but she did share a couple of things. She uh, really enjoys her AP Environmental Science classes. It's been different from any of the other science classes she has taken, and it was her first AP class. Her favorite activity this year is a little different. She enjoyed the senior sunrise. Seeing nearly the whole grade together before the start of their last year was a bittersweet and fun way to start the year. And her plans after Greendale High School, she is undecided about her future school, but plans to major in biomedical or chemical engineering. And so I would like to congratulate all three of the National Merit finalists <laughs> and invite them up. And Charlie has special recognition for his perfect ACT score. So you guys can come on up. Is Charlie giving any ACT courses this summer? <laughs> maybe. Maybe, maybe. 
Uh, we have additional recognitions this evening, and uh, the next uh, team we're going to recognize is the DECA team. Congratulations to our state qualifiers, Miga, Anna Marie, Josh, Audra, Henry, Jack, Zaid, Laney, Leo, and Noah. All 10 students qualified to compete at the DECA State Conference because they took medals and were recognized at the DECA District 6 Conference in December at Racine Case High School. Nearly 25 schools from southeastern Wisconsin competed with over 600 students participating in the day-long academic competition. For the second year straight, Greendale DECA did very well at state with four of our students advancing to the International Conference in Anaheim, California at the end of April. Best of luck to Leah Gamboa, Zaid Cart Cartank... Carta, say it for me, Maggie. Cartagena, there we go. Lainey Eggert and Noah Thompson as nationalists as nationals later this spring. And so I'd like to invite up uh, Leah, Zaid, Lainey, Noah, Miga, Henry, Anna Marie, Josh, Audra, Audrey, and Jack. Jack here tonight? We have boys bowling, and we only had one state qualifier. There he is. Okay, so congratulations to Greendale sophomore Jack Dyslin on his state qualification in the boys bowling state championships. The beginning of... <laughs> at the beginning of March, Jack got a chance to represent Greendale at the state level. After a great season locally, he showcased his talents at Ashwabanam Bowling Alley. After being eliminated from the state championship, Jack showed great sportsmanship as he stayed in Green Bay the entire weekend, cheering on his friends and peers from other schools all around. It was a great showing, and we could not be more proud of this accomplishment. So, Jack, come on up. Boys Swim also had a state showing, and I'm going to read a brief description, but none of the boys are here to accept their awards, so we're just going to recognize them uh, briefly. Oh, they are. Okay, awesome. 
Great, they are here. Never mind. Um, Noah Stanford, Sean Leibel, Raymond Johnson, and Tommy Lez Lez Lezjack. I think I said that right, but you'll have to correct me if I didn't. All had a great meet at the WIAA sectionals on February 10th. Noah won the 100 freestyle, and Sean won the 50-yard freestyle. They were also parts of a winning, the winning 200 freestyle relay team and the 400 freestyle relay team. Tommy ended up winning the most improved swimmer of the year this year. Raymond also swam at the state meet as an alternate and swam his lifetime best time during that swim. These boys represented Greendale in great fashion at the largest stage for Wisconsin High School Swim, and it's important to note that they have an opportunity to swim because of collaboration with Greenfield and Pius. I believe you go by the PG2 as your team name. So congratulations. Come on up. have a commendation for the cheer and pep band. I'm going to read something briefly, okay. um, although there's a lot to be said, and then I'm going to pass it on to you. Uh, for the second year in a row, the Greendale Cheer and Pep Band worked side by side to compete in the Game Day Live category at UCA Cheer Nationals in Orlando, Florida. After finishing as runner-up in the division in 2023, Greendale came back with a new routine and some experience on their side in 2024. They had a great showing in the semifinal round, qualifying for finals, and in finals, C Greendale performed their best routine, and the cheer and pep band were crowned 2024 national champions. This was no small feat as they beat the reigning four-time national champions in the division. And it's such an amazing experience and a huge congratulations to this group. And I'm going to turn it over to you. And I would like to introduce, we have two special guests in the house tonight. So if you guys would step in, we've got Senator Julian Bradley from District 28. And we also have Representative Bob Donovan from uh, District 84. So we're going to have them come up. Do you guys want to just come up here? Um, or do you want to do the microphone? I'll give you this one. Yeah, why didn't you guys come up front? <laughs> keep turning, keep turning. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. We're here to recognize the, the let's see, Greendale High School cheer team and pep band. But before we jump into that, I just think it's incredible that there are so many students that need to be recognized here at this, at this meeting tonight. Uh, and so just give yourselves a round of applause. That's incredible. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I will just get to the good parts. Whereas the Greendale High School cheer team and pep band placed first in the 2024 Universal Cheerleaders Association National High School Cheerleading Championship Game Day Live category, therefore the members of the Wisconsin State Legislature on the motion of myself, Senator Julian Bradley, and Representatives Bob Donovan and Chuck Wickers do commend and congratulate the Greendale High School cheer team and pep band on their exceptional victory in the 2024 Universal Cheerleaders Association Nationals Game Day Live Championship. And Bob and I worked out a quick routine that we're going to do. Bob, are you... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll save the pyramid for another time. <laughs> awesome. And stay up here for just a second. I also, um, I just want to also announce that we do have a proclamation from Governor Tony Evers to also present to the... Um, cheer team and pep band so let's give them another hand thank you
You okay? I am good. Dripping. Are Ansh or Oliver here tonight? No? All right. I don't see them, so we'll do the, the app challenge at another meeting. And another meeting, okay. Yep. All right, I want to give another round of applause for all of our student uh, athletes and academics. I will just say on behalf of the board, this is one of our favorite things to do is recognize the great accomplishments. So all of the students that were here tonight are a highlight of what we have to offer here in Greendale. So thank all of them for being here. Um, we're going to move on now. I see we have Mr. Ray Curry in the crowd. He is going to come in and talk about Panther Pride from Greendale Middle School tonight. So welcome, Mr. Curry. While the team gets set up, there, he, I know he brought a team with him from the middle school. I see While that. they get positioned, I will say that uh, Tina Zamian, the longtime coach of the cheer team, that's been a long time coming. When I was a high school cheerleader at Nationals, we didn't even make semifinals, so that has been a building um, experience for Greendale and super proud. As I told the team at some point, um, those white coats represent all of our efforts over the years to build the legacy that has now uh, been achieved. Excellent. Are you ready, Ray? Okay. <laughs> That's what we have Ryan for. He... Thank you for joining us tonight, Mr. Curry. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. I'm Ray Curry, proud principal of Greendale Middle School, and we are here. I brought a team, as you can see, with me today um, to talk about our Panther Pride and things going on at the middle school. We ground ourselves always in our district mission and visions that all students belong and empowered to learn, grow, and engage as part of a global community. Our district vision, cultivate, cultivating excellence in every student. I think you'll hear tonight some things that we are improving on in that area. Our why over the last two years at the middle school is um, by fostering a culture of care for all and engaging in high level practices, our students will increase engagement and demonstrate mastery of grade level standards. So tonight we're going to talk about culture of care for all and what we're doing to increase engagement and demonstrate mastery of standards. Now, as we narrow our focus over the last 100 days on where we are and what we're doing, um, here's some things that you'll hear tonight. In terms of building a digital data wall, we're going to talk a little bit about EduClimber and what we do with that to improve our data uh, input. Um, our culture of care, identifying students' needs and additional supports and systematic needs involved with there. And then you're going to hear, including the additional supports, how we engage in our collaborative planning using data and tracking goals quarterly with our student work protocol and how our teachers who are here tonight use data to inform instruction and goal setting. All right, I get to pass it to Aaron Koplitz, our guidance counselor. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so I'd like to start with um, what we've been doing from for the last couple of years is working with a culture of care of all, for all. And um, this year we got to expand upon and um, increase on some trainings we had last year and the year before. Um, first with uh, Character Strong. Um, so Character Strong last year was our first year of implementation. So this year we were able to still um, solidify those lessons. Um, we have time in our schedule, which is really great for all students to have access to um, social emotional learning um, curriculum. Um, the focuses for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are there: belonging, well-being, and engagement. Um, and so far, it's going um, going very well. 
Our, um, another part of our culture of care for all that is at the universal level for all students is our Sources of Strength program. So the campaigns that our Sources of Strength program use are implemented in the whole school. And we have had the opportunity so far to um, implement two campaigns. We started the year with a gratitude campaign, and right now we're in the midst of a trusted adult campaign, um, which is very fun because all the staff got to submit some childhood photos and students got to know who their staff were when they were young. And Lastly, for my part tonight, um, PBIS has been something that we have definitely increased on this year. Last year, we were coming off of some tier one training in our building, and so this year, we're putting that into practice as a whole school. Um, so we focus our school-wide focus on being prepared, respectful, and responsible, and so through that, we've created school-wide and classroom expectations um, through monthly themes as well. So the themes I've put up there um, that we have been working through this year and have had actually really fun activities, having students be incentivized to do well and meet expectations in our school. Um, so some of the examples here, we've, we've had all school expectations on voice level, which is really great to reference for many different activities throughout um, that we use throughout the school, um, school year. Um, we've had some kindness bingo um, as part of our kindness challenge. And then the photo up on the top right, we recently just had a school-wide goal to reduce um, tardies in our building to get students to cooperate and everybody help each other to be to school on time or be to class on time. Um, and as part of the incentive, um, the winning uh, grade level that, that um, increased their improvement by the most got to play the staff in a staff dodgeball game. Oh. Um, so that was a really fun event that we had recently. Um, so these are, these are all activities, Character Strong, PBIS, and Sources of Strength are really, um, really positive programs that we've been increasing and continue to work on um, into the future. Um, up next is Emily Doe with EduClimber. Hello. Um, so I could come up here and talk for hours on EduClimber and how great it is, but I'm not going to do it. Um, but it is one of my favorite um, things that we are really di digging into. Um, it is such a useful tool to look at data, um, both academic and um, social, emotional, and behavioral data for us. Um, this is just an example of what we have. We finally have live data walls, and so no more um, downloading spreadsheets, no more um, trying to like update things like that. Um, the scores come in, and so we have different data walls that we use with our student center team just to make sure that we have the proper supports that are in place um, for our students. And so um, if you look here, this is our, one of our academic data walls. And so in here we have um, our fast bridge scores, our forward data, our reading, um, our grades and things with that fall under the academic realm for our, that data wall. Um, we have charts that we use just to look and see how are we doing. So we're looking at, like this is an example of a chart um, for our English grades. And so then we can keep, um, all of these are live and so you can keep digging deeper. So if I were to click on um, the green like portion of on quarter uh, three, it will dive in and it will tell us like the students that have that and what the scores are, what their grades are within, our, within that class. And so it really um, helps us manipulate the data and really look at it in a variety of different ways for us. Um, and so we like to look at it at the actual data walls and charts uh, within the different data pieces that we have. This is our social, emotional, and behavior and wellness um, data wall that includes our sabers, um, potentially our behavioral incidents, our write-ups, our attendance, just so that we can really look to make sure, again, that the supports that are needed are in place for our students. Um, one activity, um, as we introduce and, and really learn about EduClimber and what it can all do, um, we try to do little bits and pieces for our PD, for our staff to really um, use it and, and make sure that they have like just-in-time training to really be beneficial and um, be able to manipulate the data that we um, are looking at at that time. And so um, one of the activities that we did was we had them look at our FastBridge scores. So we had, we took, we took a FastBridge in fall and then in winter. Can you just, uh, for the record, just describe what FastBridge and Sabres are? That yeah, FastBridge is our screener and then our um, Sabres is also a screener for our emotional and behavioral supports. 
And so we take our FASTBridge reading and our FASTBridge math just to look to see where students are. Um, so on, in this graph or in this chart, um, this shows just the benchmark, so at or above benchmark and then below benchmark. And then um, you can change the view of this chart to look at the different performance levels. So we can look at who's in advanced, who, is, who might be at risk. Um, and so again, if you click on any of those colors, the blue, green, yellow, or red, it digs in deeper and you can look at the students that are listed with that. And so this is what we had our staff do for an activity. Again, um, and like if we click there, then it goes into something like this. It shows our students, but then it also shows our effectiveness. And so we had them answer some questions based off of who moved um, from potentially like if there's some students that move from some risk to uh, low risk or if students were in that low risk range and kind of moved down um, to the some risk. And so we can kind of see um, who those students are, were there any surprises, and really looking at the data to see um, maybe again what needs to happen within the classroom um, for students that might have dropped um, it down into a different level. And so then again in this chart, um, we didn't show this, but you can click on any one of those areas and then it will give us the list of students. So again, that was an activity that we did with staff for them to look at um, and to dig in to our data. So next up is going to be uh, Jane Patterson and Yesenia Saavedra, our instructional support specialist. They're going to talk to us a little bit about how we're using classroom data. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Yesenia Saavedra, and this is Jane Patterson. Uh, we're going to be talking about a part of the responsibilities that we do is um, we have weekly collaborative planning meetings with uh, each of our teams. I focus primarily on ELA and social studies while Jane focuses on science and math. And one of the things that we've been focusing on is implementing a student work protocol, a high leverage tool that we've been using to look at student data. Uh, while Emily was talking about the data that we look that's more big picture, this is more uh, weekly uh, assessments that we may be using in the classroom or data that really just informs our day-to-day -day instruction. Before the collaborative meetings, our teachers decide specifically what they're gonna look at and they analyze that data and come to uh, a consensus on what proficiency look, looks like. During the collaboratives, we then uh, categorize our students into three different categories, objectives met, partially met, and objectives not met. And then after that, the most or important part is we decide what to do with the students who have either met the objectives and need to move forward with that, or they have not met the objectives, and we need to do some reteaching or planning of that sort to make sure that they um, continue learning and meet the standards and skills that we want them to. So after that process, and that happens ongoing, it happens even beyond our meetings, um, that's going on all the time. They're always using student data to make decisions about their instruction. So what we do then is we offer feedback um, strategies and reteaching strategies and things that will help um, get kids moving forward, right? Wherever they are, they're gonna move ahead. Um, so those collaborative meetings are to us what uh, the formative protocol is to, this, to the teachers. So the teachers are looking like, what do the kids need? How can I move them forward? Uh, Yesenia and I at that time in those collaborative meetings, we're looking at like, what do the teachers need? What can we bring to them to help their jobs um, be a little bit uh, easier, more effective, uh, that kind of thing. And then um, we also offer quality tools, so um, helping the teachers use tools so that the kids can analyze their own data, so that they can look at their test and say, oh, I was really great with these standards, but I really struggled with these. I need to do a little more work with that. Or um, you'll see in Lee Burrish's presentation that she uses um, graphs in different ways, so um, a grade graph, so every week, and she'll tell you more about that. Uh, kids are looking at like, how are they doing? And oh, what happened? Or um, wow, I'm amazing, and that kind of thing. So um, we offer those kinds of tools and that, and that kind of support ongoing, um, not just during collaborative meetings, but that's certainly a, a perfect time for us to do that. Next up, you'll hear from Jason Van Roo. I don't really know what to do with that. Hello. Good evening. I'm Jason Van Roo. I'm a 
adjust this a little bit. There we go. Um, I'm the art teacher at Greendale Middle School, and what I've been able to do is uh, work with what used to be uh, separate departments under one team umbrella. Uh, it's called the Encore Team, and that involves Encore classes, which are art, information, technology, tech ed, and health, as well as music, uh, choir, orchestra, band, and world language, French, Spanish, and German, as well as physical education. Uh, so we meet monthly uh, as a large team, and we meet as well, as well in departments. And our main focus this year, our developing department rubric alignment. Um, so that's within our departments, but then across the team as well. Um, we also meet and discuss formative assessments uh, in our collaborative teams. Um, we talk about uh, how formative assessments are used in our classrooms, how they are similar to other classrooms and possibly different as well. Uh, the student impact and supports that come from that is uh, students experience common language and rubrics within our departments and uh, uh, teachers share student progress, reteaching methods, um, as well as identifying students that are in need of uh, additional support and reteaching. So thank you very much. Uh, Lee Burrish is up next. Thank you, Jason. Hello. Hello. All right. I'm um, a seventh grade science teacher. Um, I, with my students, every Monday, Friday, we look at data so we can know how it helps us, drives our instruction, what are we doing well, what do we need to work on. So on Mondays, I do this grade graph. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> uh, every Monday, they uh, track what, what they're getting in science class, their letter grade, their uh, percent, they graph it uh, so they can see how their progress is uh, during the quarter. And then they also um, set a goal for the quarter and keep track of what, how they're doing with uh, assignments that they might be missing or wanting to get better at to, to redo. Um, at the bottom is where they um, reflected on their previous goal and yes, they, they met certain things, or no, they didn't. What do they need to do to be better, to achieve the goal if they didn't get it? And then on Fridays, uh, we do a graph of the week. So every Friday, they have some type of graph so that they can do better at learning how to analyze data, look at data. What is it telling us? What is it trying to show us? This is um, the kids. This is their, their own test scores on, well, their test. <laughs> Um, there's two parts to their test. There's a, like a Google form test and then there's a written response test. So every dot up there is a student uh, per the four classes that I have. And so we look at it to find out where are you in the mix of things? Um, how did you do compared to the Google form versus the written reflection or written response test? Um, and it's a good way to, for kids to see that as much as they complain about writing, that it's the part of the test that really shows what they learn and really improves their test grade overall. So that's, a, that's how I use data in uh, seventh grade science. Thank you. Here comes Sean Kamaris, who's an eighth grade teacher. What was his name? Sean. Sean. Mr. Kamaris. Sean Kamaris. All right, uh, I'm Sean Kamaris. I teach eighth grade social studies. Um, so our student protocol that we've kind of started the last month or so is every two weeks we do kind of a knowledge check is what we call them with the students. So it's like 10 questions, overall measuring what they've done in two weeks. We do them every two weeks. Um, and then me and the upper grade eighth grade teacher and Yesenia uh, will actually get together and kind of compare notes and see what questions kids struggled on um, and with that, we, what we use that for is to monitor students. So students that don't do well, we'll actually pull them during resource, and then we'll work with them and try to you know, figure out where they are so we can bring them up to where they should be. And then we also meet um, every two weeks as a team to, to look at actual our curriculum and decide, hey, they struggle with this, maybe we should simplify this for next year, because we're constantly trying to build on what we're doing and, and do better. All right, and then, yeah. 
Thank you. I'm Leah Wakeland. I teach sixth grade English. Um, so up on the um, board, you'll see an example of some breakdown data that we get from CommonLit. So every text that the students engage with in CommonLit, there's an independent practice that follows and gives us a lot of data. So it, that what you're seeing right now is just kind of the overview of what we see per text, but then there's a breakdown of individual students. So we can easily see if there's four multiple choice and they got one out of four. I can quickly pull that student um, real time and go over those questions with them um, and address any misconceptions they might have as well as like a full scope so I can see a breakdown of each question and let's say half the class missed the question we can pull that question up as a class and talk about the misconceptions that happened there um, and students who did get it right can share out what um, what they understood about the question compared to those who didn't. Um, and then Camelot also, um, it's not up on the board, but they'll give us a standards breakdown per class. So I can see per class which standards are kids excelling in, which standards are they a little weaker in, and then that helps drive our instruction in English to see which ones do we need to do some reteaching or spend more time on. Um, and then within the English department, we have common assessments, um, which are really helpful for collaboration. So um, that might look like Earlier this year, my partner and I gave a common formative on central idea, and we found that our kids kind of missed the boat. A lot of them were giving theme. Some of their central ideas were pretty vague, so we could sit down together with our common formative, the other English teacher and I, and um, look at what were the misconceptions, where did they fall apart, and then what reteaching needs to happen. And since it was a large portion, portion of our kids, we did a whole class reteach, and we worked together to kind of come up with those strategies. Um, and then on a different way, um, last week they had a grammar formative, and about five kids per class demonstrated that they didn't master that standard. And instead of having 20 kids do something independent while we reteach to the five kids, um, Kirby, my teaching partner, and I shared kids across teams. So she took the 10 kids total and did a reteach while I took the other kids and did an enrichment. So by having those common formative, it allows for us to collaborate on strategies, but also we're finding ways to share and maximize um, our resources. Great, thank you. All right, that's my team. So our next steps, our next 100 days that we're focusing in on. Um, is culture and care, so enriching, enriching character strong lessons, make sure they're done with fidelity, developing student leaders and student organizations to help lead the work as well, and then professional development and coaching, refining the student work protocol that you kind of heard about with uh, concrete fidelity checks happening, uh, are now what? As uh, you heard Leah talking about there, you know, that reteaching a mastery of skills. When we get to the reteaching point, making sure that we're consistent in the school on what's happening with that, and then becoming more proficient in our use of EduClimber. So I really appreciate the support from the board and from administration and all that you guys have done for the middle school. Uh, we do appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate my team. You know, one of the goals that I've had for the last, um, since I've, I've got the job here at GMS, is shared leadership uh, and, and shared ownership of what's happening at the middle school. And we went from a team of originally of two people and part of our sale work to now a team of nine coming here to present to the board. So uh, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing at the middle school. Any questions for us, for the team? All right, board. Any questions, thoughts? And I want to just say right off the bat, thank you to your entire staff for coming tonight. Um, it's obviously after a long day of work, and it's a Monday, so I want to thank all of you, and I know it's also right before spring break. So uh, we do appreciate the work you're doing and the time that you're taking to be here with us tonight. Uh, so, board, Joe, did you have something? I always have something. I know you do. Um, first, first of all, thank you for coming out here. Um, you know, looking, looking at this team, uh, there's a lot of gratitude coming from me, and um, I, I typically don't do this, but, you know, my family's had personal experiences. You know, Aaron, you, you were at College Park teaching Spanish probably to some of my kids. Um, Leah, I can't say enough about what you did for Sam in, in, in fifth grade, or fourth grade, I think it was, probably. Uh, Jane and Lee, you know, you guys uh, really have... Uh, been rocks there at the middle school, so, so thank you for that, a Emily. Uh, hopefully, you didn't spend too much time with my kids, but. <laughs> 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 um, but 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 to your point, you, you have a great team, um, and to the others, I have no doubt that you guys um, 
see the excellence that's going on at school and uh, are, are holding yourselves accountable to some of that. So, so, so thank you um, to everyone else there. A couple of things that I, I, I noted down and jotted down is I heard a lot about student-centric, student-centered um, learning and, and what's happening with the students there. So I think that's excellent. You know, you're, you're using the tools, you're using the data to understand how do we get to all the students. You know, we, we talk about excellence in all students. This is how you do that, you know, by, by making sure that you have the data and, and not just let, um, you know, you go in, teach the class, and, and hope that they learned it. You know, you're making sure that they learned it. You're, you're taking time to reteach or, or anything like that. So I, I wanted to acknowledge that and kind of point that out. Um, and the other thing that I heard a little bit about was just building community. You know, it, it's so important. Um, middle school is hard enough. Right, you know, it's that age where it, it's it, students are, you know, students are awkward. You know, they're they're learning. They they want that independence, but uh, they're trying to test their boundaries. They're trying to understand what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, all while trying to fit in. Um, so, so so much so, it's great that you guys are building community. Um, I, I think with social media these days, uh, with what happened with COVID uh, these past couple of years. We've lost some of that, you know, not, not only as students, but just as, you know, as a community. You know, how, how do we bring that back? So I think it's important that we nurture that and, and, um, and, and speak to that and use terminology and uh, work that's, that's relevant to them. So thank you all. Uh, thank you guys for coming in tonight. Thank you. I have a few questions. Are you done, Joe? Are you done? Go ahead, Mary. Oh, okay. Um, I'm wondering with the common lit, uh, I, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, there was some revamping or realigning, like some curriculum mapping perhaps. Could you guys speak to that? We heard from Highland View at our last meeting about how CKLA is going. Could, is anybody willing to give kind of a synopsis of how the uh, English reading, or the reading in particular, right, curriculum is going? Yeah, it's a reading yeah. and writing. There's yeah. okay. reading and writing lessons associated. Um, I think it's going great. Our kids are, you know, we're tracking data on our formatives within their classroom, and then we're checking, tracking data as a whole school, and our kids are progressing. Um, they're growing proficiency levels. Um, they're being challenged uh, daily. Um, and so from a data standpoint, uh, it, you know, it's showing a lot of success with our students, and they're engaging in the text, and I, um, do, it's going really well. It's uh, can you um, just clarify too, and I'm glad um, uh, Mary brought that up, but uh, is so common lit, is it an online curriculum? Do they have textbooks with that? And there was another question I can't think of right now, but um, oh, grammar is embedded into that. Yep. I think that's really important. We've had several um, family members come up in the past and talk about that. So could you speak to that? Yeah, so grammar is embedded into every unit. Vocabulary, vocabulary is built into every unit, and the vocabulary words are tied to the text within the unit. And then the units are a mix. So there are some online units. Um, all sixth graders, for example, read The Giver, so they had a novel that we worked through together. Um, so it's great that all sixth graders have a shared text set. And um, just a side note, like at lunchtime, they'd be comparing notes and did you read this? And so it was fun to kind of hear some of those conversations happening mm -hmm. at lunch. Um, and then um, there's writing lessons associated as well. So there's like essays they write, there's narratives they write within, incorporated within the units. And kids are still writing on paper as well as online, right? Yep, yep. There's, yeah, there's a, a definitely a blend. Um, when we read, do a whole class novel, there's in-text questions they're, that they're writing out, and then they do a quick comprehension check on the computer. So there's a blend. It's not solely on the computer. Yeah. It's a, a blend of written work as well as on the computer work. Um, and then like um, novel in hand, and then we incorporate some book clubs following some of the computer-based units that are, are tied to the themes of the online text. Okay, great. great. Thank you. I just have one more question, and um, and it does take, I, I'll echo what Joe said, it takes a really special personality to work with 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, so um, congratulations, and thank you for doing that, because there's not a lot of people that would like to redo middle school. Um, edu climber. So how are you, it was fascinating to see how you're using it in each of your subject areas. How is the data actually being collected? You know, are the students, you know, how is, the, how are you getting all that data? So it all comes in electronically and in, in the, on the back end. Um, they build 
Um, so it pulls in from FastBridge, it pulls in all of our forward scores, it pulls in from our from Infinite Campus, oh, okay. um, all the information. So everything so you're entering everything in. Everything in, yes. Okay. So um, our behavior, if, if we write behavior errors, um, those come in as incidents to us. Um, all the attendance comes over through Infinite Campus. So it's, it comes over on the back end of that and then into a very nice... Beautiful. Better than a Google form, I would Better say. Better than a yeah. Google form. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Right. District priority two, um, and I know Tasha has a few questions about this. District priority two on your scorecard, prepare K-12 students with the skills to explore and be ready for college and career pathway of their choice. And the goal that, that you set at the beginning of the year was to build a digital data wall to track college and career readiness indicators, identify students needing additional support, and plan for systematic needs engage professional learning communities with the data to set and track goals quarterly, with evidence being EduClimber visualizations, target as a real-time dashboard with academic indicators, behavior indicators, and emotional wellness indicators. And so what you saw tonight was the implementation of that goal that you set. So you are driving um, the work from as a board. And Tasha, I know you had questions. Yeah, I just had a question. As far as like the common lit, I know the scorecard, like at the elementary level, they had um, like how they measure proficiency. So I don't know what testing methods you use then to test like if common lit, like how proficient they are or what level they're at. I haven't, we haven't seen data on that. So common lit comes with a really nice screener that gives us uh, beginning of the year data, middle of the year data, and end of the year data. So we're able to track how our students are doing based on their lessons and their units. Uh, my favorite part is that it's standards align and really ties closely to the forward testing standards. And so we saw, we looked at the data from last year and we saw there are a lot of parallels and typically if our students grew in the common lit assessments, they also grew in the forward testing. And this year I'm very excited to report that all three of our grade levels in the middle of the year assessment, which they just took in January, have gone up. So all of our grade levels are trending in the right direction. And that's super exciting to see because now in our collaboratives, we're just gonna keep working on that and building off of that. So hopefully we have really good results at the end of the year as well. Great. Tasha, anything else? Um, well, um, the um, what um, Ms. Birch said about um, the tests for, for science, I have to tell you, I really like the CERs. Was that like your claim, your evidence and reasoning? Because I, I think that's like a great way to have kids like really think through things and have to write it down for, I mean, because they're going to have to use that skill going forward. So I, I mean, my daughter doesn't like it, but I really <laughs> <laughs> And that carries over to pretty much all subject areas, the CERs, right? So that's a good tool, as you said. Um, Rob, anything you'd like to add? Mary touched on the edgy climber, but I was curious about that, but I'll just reiterate what some other people said. I, you can tell that you guys have a, um, you guys are determined to help the students of Greendale. Um, it comes through with your presentation. So I appreciate the dedication that you guys bring to helping everybody's kids in the community. It's appreciated. I'm going to put our student board members on the spot a little, but you guys have gone through the middle school, both of you, correct? So is there anything that you'd like to ask or any thoughts on this? Was any of this in place when you were there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that sweet? Um, middle school did suck. Yeah. I, it actually, it is nice though seeing the teachers here. Like I think I've had like the majority of teachers and just like flashbacking all those memories and just really special ones in my heart and everything. And they did the best they could at the time. And I remember sitting down and like one-on-ones with most of my teachers who have, I did have and every single one of you. Um, but I think this is just the perfect way to ensure that even the people who don't ask and cause I definitely did ask and I definitely was not quiet. Um, but the people who are quieter and the people who are a little more so need their test score to stand out versus their voice to stand out. I think it perfectly can target them and find them and still help them. And the reteaching thing, I will preach about that because I think it's so important to not let anyone fall behind and then try to continue on after they have to learn in their study and everything. Even in high school, it sucked um, not having as much reteaching and then now we get to have like flex and everything. So it's we're implementing it in all grades and it really is helpful and it like really does mean like everyone means everyone. So I think it's great. Does that help you be more uh, to be more comfortable asking for help too when you have those opportunities for reteach, I'm uh, assuming? I think it made it more 
uh, it was less of a barrier in my head and other people's heads too because at some point um, there were moments where like I guess it's just kind of like on me to figure out and everything especially when there wasn't a lot of collaboration going on between students who also didn't get it and stuff like that um, but I definitely do think that now with the clear opportunity there's more people who will ask for it versus if there's not even the option there's it's very rare that students are going to do the things I didn't be like can you pretty please give me like a minute or two or something like that so I think right. it's really good very good points thank you Kaya how about you Nick yeah I just wanted to say Nick you liked middle school better than Kaya right oh. <laughs> so, uh, as arduous as those uh IXLs may be and all those PEAs and CERs <laughs> I can say that um you know <laughs> it, it's all worth it. And a lot of the skills that I've learned in middle school, especially a lot of the teachers that are here today, you know, they really carry over a lot of the writing styles and in the math. And I just want to say on all the changes, you know, it's really uh, great to see all that can change in just a few years. I mean, I was only in the middle school th three or four years ago, and this is just a huge amount of, of great change. And I, I think it's great to see how they're so uh, flawlessly like, tracking each of the students, being able to fill in in those areas. It's really just great to see. And I'm sure we're going to have a uh, Great batch of students for high school teachers in the next few years. <laughs> and it was really good, though, too, seeing how many advanced people were up there, too. Mm -hmm. um, now, too, in the high school where a lot of our stuff is combined and there's, like, specific assignments where the classes can be honors and regulars depending on the student. Um, I think it was so good seeing the students, like, still striving or, like, showing the numbers, which I think a lot of people were scared of weren't going to happen if reteaching was happening because it's like, are you keeping the other students down by giving everyone that same time? But at, it just if anything, gives those independent people who are striving on their own without their reteaching more time to take the extra time. And even if they're hearing it again, now they can think about it further and what else does this mean? And that just spirals, especially like math and science and really everything, though. Great. That's really good. Thank you. I had a question about EduClimber. Um, is there carryover for the high school? And are you able to work with the guidance counselors at the high school to use that tool to help them get a better snapshot of the students? Yes, absolutely. And they actually do. Um, we meet on a regular basis. We actually have a meeting coming up just to look at um, how, like, with our student-centered teams, because there's a student-centered team at the middle school, at the high school, at elementary levels. And so we all come together to see, like, what, how are we using our data? How are we building those walls or the data walls? And how are we manipulating the data to see it? Um, and so that's definitely happening within or at the high school level as well. Does and it's also help happening. Mm -hmm. oh, it's also happening at the elementary level. Oh, at okay. K K fourth through twelfth grade, we are using Edge Climber to look at student data, both from a culture standpoint and an academic standpoint. Okay, great. So it is a tool then that has its uses across the grade, uh, the district. So that's awesome. Um, I do want to again thank all of you for coming tonight. First of all, does anyone else have anything final? Um, it, it really means a lot to us to hear directly from our students, as you saw they were here earlier getting recognized, and you as the educators coming in and sharing your expertise. I've had uh, great experiences with several of you. I know, Jason, you've had um, evening art shows for the community with the talent that you, your students and you have shared. Uh, Lee and I actually taught together for four years, and to see how motivated you still are at this point of your career is awesome. Um, and of course, uh, Jane, I can't. Oh, no, I, I know. <laughs> You're still younger than me. I'm older. Seasoned. Than <laughs> seasoned. But and then Jane, Jane and I go all the way back to middle school. But I just want to say every single one of you in here, I can tell and feel has a passion for what you do. And that does carry over to our students. And I hear about it a lot when I walk my dogs through the community, the impact that you're having on students, especially the middle schoolers who hang out at Dale Creek Park, as I'm sure you know, um, oftentimes spending time back there. But um, thank you all for what you're doing, Mr. Curry. We appreciate your leadership as well um, as um, Emily Doe uh, for the things that you do to help, you know, kind of umbrella the school and just make it what it is. So thank you for coming in. And I really appreciate our student board members engaging with you because I think it uh, speaks volumes to the impact that you've all had on them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we are at the... Um, not the communications, uh, student. Yes, we are at communications. Um, so Dr. Mitzik, any communications this evening? I have a couple. Uh, classrooms in the schools are buzzing this week as we complete our final week of school before spring break. There will be no school from March 25th through April 1st. Staff will return on April 1st for professional learning and school resumes for students on Tuesday, April 2nd. 
there are three concerts this week at the high school. The Dick District Orchestra concert is tomorrow night, Tuesday. Uh, the band concert, district band concert is Wednesday, and the district choir concert is Thursday. All of the concerts begin at 6.30 p.m. in the high school. And those include performers from elementary through high school, uh, depending on the performance group. Uh, the third and final referendum community information night was held on March 13th. Community members with questions about the operational referendum are encouraged to visit the district website or contact the district office directly. Election day is Tuesday, April 2nd. Ability awareness and acceptance months are being observed in Greendale schools. During March and April, our students are learning about the ABCs of ability awareness and acceptance throughout daily announcements and classroom lessons. During Spread the Word Inclusion Week, GHS Buddy Club members shared a read aloud video with their peers during advisory, and the video is posted on the district website. Second graders at Canterbury Elementary wrapped up their studying about insects and put their knowledge into a story about an insect of their choice in either a fiction or nonfiction work. Students typed their stories and illustrated the insect they wrote about. College Park kicked off their book March Madness Challenge. Lower and upper level each voted for a set on a set of books. Winners face off as the brackets progress throughout the month. Teachers will read one book to their class and students will hear the other book during library. Books for week one for third, fourth, and fifth graders are drawn together and the day the crayons quit. Uh, science students at Greendale Middle School's Team Discovery, the expanded their exploration of how DNA affects variations of traits through a lab, and students broke the cells of strawberries and used the extraction liquids they mixed to pull the DNA from the strawberry mixture. By the end, students could look at and touch the DNA they collected from their strawberries. And that concludes my communications. Thank you, Dr. Midzik. We're going to move on to student I updates. Oh, I, go ahead. I just wanted to, um, as part of communication, I thought it was important um, I think everyone at the board um, received communication earlier uh, last week um, from Allison Buchanan, who's a partner at Quarles and Brady. Uh, it's similar to what she had uh, shared with us, so I was familiar with the meeting that she had with us in uh, November. But I wanted to just read into the record uh, that on Tuesday, March 12th, we all received a memo from Allison Buchanan, uh, legal counsel at Quarles and Brady. Um, Basically, part of it says, although there is no specific law regarding the role of board members, it is our view that they may spe speak freely in favor or against the referendum. Board members may also form and participate in citizen committees and may engage in other activities to promote or oppose the referendum. So long as they follow the applicable laws, such as campaign finance laws or, if applicable, Wisconsin open meeting laws and do not spend district funds or use district resources. However, if a board member chooses to speak in favor or against the referendum, the board member should make clear that he or she is speaking as an individual citizen and not on behalf of the board or in his or her role as board member. I just wanted that. Uh, Thank you. for That was great to read into uh, the record. Except on school property. It shouldn't be on school property. I, I'm reading from the letter that we all received. Right, but we're not supposed to be on school okay. property, do we? Yeah. I'm just so I just want to add that clear so that record I will just go on but um, that letter anyone can look at it through open records we did receive that um, I want to go on to our student board members uh, you're going to do your update in a moment but both um, Kaya and Nick were part of a wonderful production if you haven't seen it uh, Legally Blonde just finished its last showing on Saturday um, Kaya was the judge. Nick, what was your actual title? I was father. Uh, you were the father. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I just have to say it was an amazing performance. I brought a longtime Greendale resident to it. You guys did a great job. We had a lot of laughs during it. We were sitting right up in the front, so we had great seats. But I, I'm sure one of you is going to talk about that. But I just want to really commend you because I don't think what people don't understand about you is you guys do have a very busy school life, um, you know, not just at the board table here, but the things you're all involved with. And I think you guys were here probably four or five days a week until 930 at night. We could hear you across the hall during some of our meetings. And I just really want to give hats off to both of you for, for the leadership that you do give. And I think we should give you a round of applause for that. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll move on to your updates. Please feel free to share what's going on. Yeah. So I was going to say that Legally Blonde finished their last show. 
Um, and then spring sports have been starting up. So baseball tryouts were today in the field. Soccer tryouts, girls soccer were also today. Softball um, began a week ago about. And then track and field has had a couple meets already on the weekends. And then there were preseasons and trials going on. Um, boys tennis and boys golf are going to start in the next few weeks. And then we're looking forward to a very, very fun spring season. And then for prom, so prom's right around the corner and everyone loves prom. Um, we have been working on, and I asked my boss actually to host a fundraiser for prom at the Panther Pub. It's going to be Wednesday, April 10th, and it's going to be all hours of the day. And so even um, early lunch hours all the way till it closes. So if you want to get your lunch that day too, we're going to be telling students that if we want to leave that day, they should go to the pub. You can call food to take out too if you don't want to stay there. But um, it's going to be a profit share. So we're going to be getting 20% of the sales, which is a very big amount, very generous. What is the date of that again? Um, April 10th. It's a Wednesday. Awesome. So now at this fundraiser, the junior prom committee is also going to be announcing the uh, theme in the venue, which we're very excited about. It's going to be a, a big prom this year. Dr. Minzik knows a lot about that because of all the meetings. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, at this uh, dinner, we're also going to be having a variety of raffle baskets, such as a brand new pair of AirPods. Yes. Nice. So, but um, I also want to make note that if you're going to tell anyone, make sure that the restaurant or the server, anyone knows that they're part of Greendale so that um, those profits will be part of what we'll get at the end of the night. It's uh, just to make sure that it's like the proper um, keeping track of everything. They also tell if you go sit down, make sure like you write it on your check for the server to take so there's no one forgets anything. You get kind of cha kind of chaotic. Um, and it's then, all day long, Kaya? Yes. Okay. So those AirPods are also donated by my staff sergeant, Mr. Staff Sergeant Medina, and then we're also going to be looking forward to a future partnership we're working on that will be sponsoring the school, which some of those funds would be going towards prom to pay for the big and extravagant prom we're planning, and then future proms and other things that um, we can use that funding towards. So we're very excited and hoping to get that done this year, if not in the years coming. And that is with uh, United States Marine Corps, for the record. Nice. And then um, lastly, some updates from the music department is that uh, the Greendale High School Choirs and Orchestra, uh, members from that are going to be traveling to Ireland next week on the 23rd they leave. And they're going to be uh, performing in some clinics, a live concert, and many sightseeing opportunities. Uh, also last week, I believe, the 2024 marching band show T-Squared was announced. So uh, both the drum line and the front ensemble have been practicing. So the show will combine the works of uh, classical composer Tchaikovsky and then also uh, pop artist called Taylor Swift. You might have heard of her before. So <laughs> kinda just coming up there. <laughs> but uh, we're looking forward to this uh, exciting season. And that concludes our updates. Great. Thank you both. All right. Uh, I thought I was going to have to go without a script here. But um, we do have uh, the next thing on our agenda is our comments and questions from visitors. I'm going to welcome all of you that are here to speak this evening. We would like to remind you that the board meetings are for the purpose of carrying on the business of the school district. They are offici official business meetings that are held in public. Through board um, bylaw 0167, the school board allows citizens to make comments by scheduling two opportunities on the agenda to receive citizen comments. In accordance with the intent of the Open Meetings Law, please be aware that although the Board of Education welcomes comments from the public, it cannot discuss or debate items brought up during citizen comments. In order to hear from all citizens who wish to speak and to ensure that the official business of the district is addressed, our board bylaw sets a time limit for citizen comments. We will be adhering to that board bylaw and its time limits at tonight's meeting. Persons wishing to address the board are asked to come to the podium and state their name and address for the record. Comments are limited to one time, and the individuals who will be speaking will be limited to three minutes. Citizen comments are limited to a period not to exceed 30 minutes, and we do have a second citizen comments later in the meeting. Thank you. So will um, anyone like to come up tonight? Good evening, Mr. Bingenheimer. Good evening, Al Bingenheimer from Oakwood Lane. It's easy to spend, tough to budget, tougher to succeed, but succeed we must. We saw a lot of examples of that this evening of students succeeding. But the spending more result in success. A lot of people want to spend more money, hoping that we'll get better results. Well, let's look at some examples. 
Baltimore spends $21,000 per student, 0% are proficient in math out of 23 schools. Our neighbor, Greenfield, has a DPI report card of uh, about 66%, an F. For all you teachers, that would be an F, right? Ten per, they spend 10% less per student than Greendale. So maybe spending more might help them. I don't know. Well, we're being told that we cannot cut a budget without catastrophic results. However, Greendale has the lowest number of teachers per student of all the surrounding districts, according to DPI data. That's uh, around 20% fewer students per teacher than average, and those teacher counts are based on Code 53. However, Greendale is uh, average, 70s. We're all from Lake Wobegon, I guess. Greendale's average teacher salary is the second highest of five districts surrounding us. In fact, when factoring in report card rank, Greendale is 34% higher in performance cost. In other words, how much do you spend to get that 70-some percent compared to, like, New Berlin? Based on these results, uh, the budget and taxes cannot be justified. And for those residents that are, are here, 40% of your property taxes go to the school district. There was a gentleman out of New York. He complained about the rent. Well, we're complaining the taxes here are too damn high. Thank you. Thank you. Other speakers, good evening. Elaine? Trustee Unger, I should say. <laughs> Elaine Unger, 4815 Sutton Lane. I had to wait quite a bit to get up here this <laughs> evening. My goodness. Um, I want to thank Joe, Kathy, and Mary for coming out to the Village Trustee Candidate Forum last Thursday at the Hose Tower. I know there was a big event here at the high school, and I appreciate your taking the time to come out and learn more about the candidates for Village Trustee. As you know, I'm up for re-election um, on April 2nd, and by now, residents in Greendale should have received my flyer on your doorstep, and if not, you can go to my website, ungerforgreendale.com, and you will see a list of accomplishments since 2021 in the flyer and on the website. Also, tomorrow starts early voting at Village Hall. So if you um, are out of town on April 2nd, you can um, early vote starting tomorrow through March 29th from 8 to 4 at Village Hall. Um, and I just want to thank the school district for the collaboration over the years. We were able to help on the village side, um, the school district, with a loan um, last year. We collaborate on IT services, asphalt projects, school resource officers, crossing guard program. Um, thank you for the support on the vaping regulations. We know that vaping is an issue here in the high school as well. Hopefully, um, students are abiding by the policies that have been set and the comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Come on up, Amy. Hello, Amy Pavella, 8875 Garden Lane. And I was just hoping to have some clarity around the agenda for 4.2 when you guys go over it um, regarding the CKLA expansion. 
Um, I'm not really familiar with how the curriculum funding works, and it seems we had a loan for the current portion. Not sure how that works going forward. I know the state recommends it, but doesn't require it. So just wanted to gain a little bit better understanding on that and see if those types of fees are normal um, and what types of things that, that covers. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. And that is on our agenda, so we'll be discussing tonight. Thank you. Uh, other speakers? Good evening, Elise. Hi, Lee Siski, 5679 Oriel Court. Um, it never comes out right. I don't know why. Um, kind of what Elaine said, early voting starts tomorrow. Um, and since this is the last school board meeting before election, um, I wanted to wish everyone, Elaine, Colleen, Mary, um, Brian, and um, Kristen, all the best of, of luck. Um, it's win or lose. You know, it's been an honor to run and um, to represent our great community. Um, my goal is always to represent my, my kids and my family and myself in the best light. Um, you know, I'm always honest and truthful and, you know, it's been actually a really good campaign and, um, yeah. So good luck to everybody and have a great night and see you all soon. Thank you, Elise. Good evening, Kristen. Hi, Kristen Settle, 8880 Green Hill Lane. Um, proud varsity cheer mom so tonight was very exciting <laughs> thank you all for the attention that you gave to all of the students in band oh my god you guys the musical was so good it was so good you got the the cast and the crew did a phenomenal job um, and I'm just really proud of all of you and I just want to give kudos um, to the orchestra and the choir for traveling to Ireland and for Mr. Jones and for Miss Whiting for chaperoning all of those students for seven days and never being allowed to have a Guinness. So, <laughs> I mean, that takes, that takes some character and some perseverance. Um, I am a candidate for school board. The election is coming up and voting is so critically important. I want to encourage everyone to take time to get to know the candidates and understand who it is you're voting for and what their values are. There are three upcoming opportunities to learn more about the candidates. One is uh, tomorrow evening from 7 to 9 p.m. at Explorium with Brian Bach. One is Wednesday evening from 5 to 7 p.m. at Gift of Wings with me, Kristen Settle. And one is Sunday afternoon, March 24th, uh, from 12 to 3 p.m. at the Greendale Host Tower with Elise Siski. And so whether you go to our websites, whether you talk to us as we're going door to door and meeting voters, please take time to get to know who you're voting for. It has been so wonderful to connect with residents and friends again um, as I've, I've been going door to door and just hearing stories about my mom as one of their teachers or my dad as, as they work together. And so um, it's just been really gratifying and really humbling to hear all of that. And it means a lot to me. And, and like Elise said, win or lose, it's been a great campaign and a great experience. And I do wish everyone a very good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Carla Corral, 5379 Eastway. We have all been teenage middle schoolers trying to find our place in the world and just trying to figure out where we fit in. I'm sure everyone has experienced some kind of bullying at that age. But imagine being 14 again in today's society. Your bully has 24-7 access to you through friends and social media. My daughter has been bullied and threatened since December. These threats were not taken serious and she was set up and assaulted in January. Myself and other parents fought to have the boy removed from the school, but his friends remain. They continue to harass, bully, and threaten my daughter. My daughter is told to report it. She does, and they investigate. And my daughter is told the bullies were talked to. Other students report it. Stop it's are put in. Police get involved, and nothing. Just more bullying, harassment, and threats for telling. Proof has been shown over and over. I have been sending numerous emails. I have called, met with the associate principal, requested meetings with the principal, and just keep getting told we are investigating or we talk to the students or my concerns get brushed off like I'm overreacting. But God forbid, let it be your kid. My daughter was pulled from a class, walked out of school daily, and still it continues. Now they are teasing her due to her race, calling her nappy head. The main bully continues to share the video of the assault on social media. I understand the school can't control what these kids post, but they sure as heck can control appropriate punishments for these bullies. Stop talking and start showing that bullying and racism will not be tolerated like your policy says, which I do have a copy of in case anyone needs a refresher on Greendale school policy. Suspend, then expel, because I can tell you I'm not going away and I will not be silenced. 
I will continue to fight for my daughter and any other victim and repeat our story to anyone and everyone who will listen until something is done. Thank you, and we do take our discipline serious in the district. If, um, I believe you have your contact information here, but if not, if you could leave it with our administrative assistant, um, Marianne Jacobson, will follow up with you. Thank you. Good evening, Nat Godley, 5331 Millbank Road, speaking on, be on behalf of Page, people advocating for Greendale equity. There appears to be a growing climate of racism and other abuse in the schools. An administration's lackluster response is causing further harm to students. Aside from the parent we just heard from, Page has received reports from other parents of racist chants on the bus, the frequent use of the N-word in hallways, and other racist epithets being used against students of color, particularly at the middle school, but also at other schools in the district. This uptick in bias incidents has not been met with an appropriate response from school's administration. Only the most egregious per perpetrators appear to have incurred appropriate disciplinary consequences, leading to ongoing bullying, as we just heard, and an unsafe environment for other students. Further, students who have been the victims of bias attacks and their families have not been offered adequate support, leading to increased emotional distress and anxiety at being in school that has obviously had a severe impact on their academic and social experience. Lastly, no support has been offered to other students who may have witnessed such racist and other bias attacks, and we have received uh, um, reports from students who weren't themselves victims but were traumatized by seeing them uh, attacked. Nor has there been sufficient training in how, to, how individual students can take responsibility for countering such acts with their own anti-racist and upstander behavior. Bullying, especially when bias is involved, must be met with consequences that unambiguously communicate that such behavior is utterly unacceptable. Victims of bullying and their families must receive prompt and adequate support. And the district administration must ensure that the entire school community hears loud and clear not just the message that such behavior is against Greendale values, but also that everyone has a role to play in preventing such behavior and creating the caring and diverse community of learners that we aspire to be. The schools must urgently address this problem before it grows out of control and before more students are harmed. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak during this first citizen comments? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on with our agenda. There will be a second citizen comments at the end of the meeting. Uh, we're gonna move on to our approval of the meeting minutes from March 4th. Uh, if there's any questions, if not, we will, I'm looking for a motion to approve action item 1.1. I move approval of the regular board meeting minutes of March 4th, 2024 as outlined in agenda item 1.1. I second. So we do have a motion and a second to approve the regular meeting minutes from March 4th, 2024 in item 1.1. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, motion carries. Item two is our financial reports. We received the monthly financials from Jonathan Mitchell, our business manager. Um, Jonathan, is there anything you'd like to share with us before we discuss and take a motion? The financial report is through, <coughs> excuse me, the month of February, there were 38.39% of budgeted revenues. That was almost identical to last year, which was 39.24% at this point in the year. On the expenditure side, we're below where we were this uh, this last year. We're at 46.17% of budgeted expenses in the operational fund, and that compared with 50.13% in the prior year. So we've shared some of those variances as they relate to the HVAC projects that were done at Highland View, um, <clears throat> but also shared in that financial report that there's uh, some additional dollars that are assigned uh, for a health insurance adjustment at the end of this year. So that was something that we discussed with the board back in October, that we expect that plan to run higher than what was originally budgeted, and we assigned additional budget dollars um, there. So we would expect to be under budget at this time of year. We're currently on target with the operational budget deficit of $1.58 million. We also provided an update regarding the ESSER spending and uh, as we've talked about in prior meetings, ESSER 1 and 2 are completed, and ESSER 3, we're now at 80%, 87% of uh, the allocation being spent. 
and that's the last of those dollars and those are committed between staffing contracts through the end of this year and then a HVAC project for summer of 24. So with that, happy to answer any other questions. So any questions tonight? I know we've all had a chance to look at the, um, the packets that we've received. Any questions? Well, um, I had, well, I had spoken with Jonathan earlier today for quite an extended period of time. And I did have one question I thought you were going to check in on was that non-capitalized uh, um, technology decrease. Um, yep, we'll pull some additional data on that and put it into the DU. Just okay. like what makes up that 480 object account. Yes. Yep. Okay. okay. Great. We'll get that this week. Thank you for answering my questions throughout the day today as I was um, going through them. Yep. Um, anyone else have any questions? If not, I'll be looking for a motion to approve checks and disbursements. So I make a motion to approve um, checks and disbursements. So general disbursements um, for a total of four hundred eighty-six thousand four hundred. Four dollars and nine cents, and total payroll for two million four hundred seventy thousand three hundred thirty-nine dollars and sixty-eight cents, for a total amount to be approved of two million nine hundred fifty-six thousand seven hundred forty-three dollars and seventy-seven cents. We got a second. I'll second. So we do have a motion and a second to approve checks and disbursements in item two point three. Any discussion further? Further discussion, I should say. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, motion carries. Our next item is our new business, which is approval of personnel and our approval of director of pupil services. And Dr. Midzik, I'm going to turn this over to you. I believe we have our individual with us tonight. Uh, so we are recommending Ms. Denise Burnett, who you'll get a chance to hear from during our special education program update. She is currently serving as a program support specialist in our schools and has been with us since 2017 as an early childhood teacher and then our uh, program support specialist. And we are really excited for her to um, continue the work that Rachel has done. Thank you. So, so if, you, if you want to, I, we recommend approval, and then if you want to give her an opportunity yeah, to say I a few words after you make the approval, we'll make and the we approval will do that. First. So um, any mm -hmm. questions? If not, I'll be looking for a motion to approve our um, appointment of Director of Pupil Services in Item 4.1. I motion that we approve the appointment of Ms. Denise Burnett as the Director of Pupil Services, effective July 1st, 2024. Um, Ms. Burnett, well, I, I'm not, do you want this whole thing right into the record? Or? No, just okay, okay, sorry. All right, uh, move approval of agenda item 4.1. Thank you. I second. So we do have a motion and a second to approve um, Denise Burnett as our Director of Pupil Services. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, we'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, so motion carries. And Denise, we'd love to hear from you if you have a minute. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> How exciting, huh? Yes, very exciting. So thank you. I'm really excited about this opportunity. I have worked for the school district for this is my eighth year. So I started as an early childhood teacher. I work with families doing the early childhood diagnostics. So really focus on building those relationships with our students coming in at three and then continuing those through my program support role as the elementary program support specialist. So I am very passionate about working with families and with students and meeting everyone's needs. I'm looking forward to this opportunity to grow my leadership. I've learned so much so far and I am excited to continue to work with my colleagues. Excellent. And all of these people over here. <laughs> and I was going to mention, I think I first met you at one of the SEAT events at, maybe it was at Highland View, I think. You've been involved with the community events for our students yeah. with special needs. So I don't know if you want to say a word or two about that. Yeah, we're really excited about SEAT. I think it's something that um, Rachel brought um, to us, and Nikki and Nikki and I have done a lot of work with SEAT. I think it's important to hear family voice and our families have already taught us so many things and we're looking forward to continuing that relationship with our families and um, just 
being out in the community and providing the sensory friendly events so that all of our families can be part of the Greendale activities. And they're pretty amazing events and I, encur I encourage the entire community to take part in those events, I, the work you do. But I want to congratulate you on behalf of the board. We're looking forward to working with you and we're still thankful we have Rachel as the transition takes place. So thank you for being with us tonight. I know it's been a long time for you to sit here to wait for this moment, but we're really happy to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, moving on to agenda item 4.2, we're going to look at the approval of the English language arts curriculum. And we've had a lot of discussion about ELA. Uh, Dr. Midzik, do you want to lead this off for us, please? Yes, so in June, um, the uh, Ms. Olson and uh, those who were responsible for do working through the curriculum review process for English language arts uh, brought forward a recommendation for can 4K through 5th grade uh, for the CKLA curriculum. And you approved an extended pilot as well as a six-year loan, trust fund loan for $373,800. $373, um, and it will be paid back over six years. Uh, based on the results of the pilot and recent activity at the state legislature around um, approving curriculum that are eligible for reimbursement under Act 20. Um, we are bringing that forward to recommend full adoption and implementation of CKLA, for which we've already taken out a trust fund loan. Approval um, of the curriculum, we are eligible for reimbursement from the state for up to 50% of curriculum costs. So that trust fund loan that has been taken out, we have budgeted to pay back over six years, uh, but we would be able to prepay uh, a significant portion of that uh, with a reimbursement from the state after it is approved by the board officially and uh, we submit for reimbursement. And I will turn it over to Ms. Olson to speak through some of the results and why the recommendation is there. Yes, so just to, I mean, 300, it's a big investment, but it's also an investment in all of our students. And when we're thinking about it from a per student per year um, standpoint, it's $57 per student per year for six um, years, which to get a wealth of resources that CKLA provides to our students, I think it is absolutely worth it. Um, and you all have approved that um, loan earlier in the school year. Um, through our extended pilot, we've yielded very positive results, including um, our reading achievement across all grade levels based on the base uh, benchmark assessments. They take a, a, a benchmark assessment um, in the beginning of the year, and then they take a mid, and every grade level is seeing huge, tremendous growth. It is different than the um, universal screener data, um, and this is based on the standards and kids growing in the curriculum that they're being taught. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're also noting um, huge engagement increases around knowledge building units and the complex texts. Our kids are reading books um, with more complexity than ever before. We're also having more alignment to state standards and um, we are able to differentiate um, for students as well. And um, the curriculum integrates not just reading, but writing and speaking and listening, which is a really important part of the ELA standards. So we are asking that the board um, formally adopt the CKLA curriculum for grades K-4 through 5th grade for ELA through 2029, for the 28-29 school year. And this would also help us um, gain have access to the monies available through Act 20. And I'm available for any questions. Great, thank you. And we did have a great presentation last week um, from several teachers, College Park, right? Highland View. Uh, and Highland View, I apologize. No, um, I'll pay. Yes. College Park is also doing great work, so. They are, yes, they, and, and so we had an opportunity to ask some questions, but uh, obviously with this new law, Act 20 going into place, are there any other questions or comments from the board? Well, Mary? I just wonder, which or? benchmark assessments are you talking about? Because like last week for like the scorecard, they were using the fast bridge and some of the grades, it was like not what one would expect. So I, I'm just not sure if the fast bridge is like necessarily met. So I have, I have strong feelings about um, using 
FastBridge as a standards aligned assessment. So FastBridge, our goal is to screen kids and it's a, it's, it's a test where depending on how a student performs at the first, it's adaptive. So if they get a question wrong, then the test kind of gives them an easier question. If they get it right, they get a harder question. So um, although FastBridge is really important to make sure we're not losing any students and making sure that we're giving supports to all of our kids, it is not the best indicator of standards mastery. So it's a little tricky. Um, the idea of FastBridge is to make sure that we are catching kids that we're not catching in other ways, where the benchmark assessments that we are looking at through the curriculum are based on um, the Wisconsin State standards and the Common Core. So our teachers are teaching those standards, we're addressing those standards, and our students are performing. Um, so it, that, it is a little different. Are there any, an oh, go ahead. Though, this benchmark assessment, that's a, another assessment. That's a CKLA assessment. Oh, okay. So I'm yep. just wondering if it would help like, the board to see like that assessment as far as like where they are. The progress. Proficiency instead of using. Yes. So for the I, scorecards because it really didn't make sense to me. Is no, I 100% agree. And I think that's something that we're trying to figure out how to share with the board because it's our first year of adoption with the assessment. So we're trying to figure out what would be the best indicators. And once we have the forward data, we can see which one to align. And then we'll absolutely include that for our board reports moving forward. With Act 20, are there any screeners that they are, I, I mean, and again, I'm putting this the thoughts in the politicians' hands, but there are educators on the committee that are making the decisions. Are there any specified screeners that they are recommending more than others? So the, the, the literacy um, curriculum council is looking at different screeners and diagnostics, um, but I think FastBridge is just like any, regardless of what screener you adopt, it is going to be trying to screen kids and make sure that it, no one's falling through the cracks. That is the purpose of a screener. Often they try to conflate that they are standards driven, but it is an adaptive test versus keeping that high bar of the academic standards. So it's very, it's very nuanced. It, educators understand it, but from like a community, it's, I totally understand why it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other Could you, uh, just thinking about the public comment, um, I don't know if Kim or Jonathan wants to address the financial piece. Yeah, so bit. as I said in the introduction, the purchase price for the curriculum uh, was $373,800. Uh, Maggie calculated that to be $57 per student per year, but the $373,800 uh, is the part of the trust fund loan that you approved and have taken out that is intended to be paid back over a six-year period. Uh, approval, full adoption and approval tonight uh, makes the district eligible for a request for reimbursement through Act 20. And uh, the law is stating that we can be reimbursed up to 50% of the cost. Uh, we will submit for maximum reimbursement once the board has approved for full adoption. And, and because we um, did the six year, we had a 15% discount, which resulted in a $75,000 discount as well. So and in other words, the six year, we're using CK, we're committed to CKLA from K4 to fifth grade correct. for the next six years. And then um, is there any, uh, are we accruing any costs, any new consumable workbook? All of that uh, is included in the six year adoption. Oh, okay. So that's good. So it was just like a one time fee. That is the plan because then you can get in at a cheaper rate. And how, <laughs> of, how often are we reviewing ELA? Isn't it like every six years? It's every six years, correct. I guess I'd just like to say thank you. Um, I think this is a good example where the people who know how to educate our students here in Greendale are at this table or in their classrooms or in our schools. Um, we don't need to wait for Madison to give us direction on, right. on what we want to adopt. So I think this is a great example of that you know, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit validating, right, um, that, that what this team decided to do and we've been piloting for a while, but a little bit. We extended the pilot this past year. Um, you guys know what you were doing, and, and no disrespect to our visitors from earlier, um, but uh, but thank you. And I think this validates that you guys know what you're doing. So thank you. I will share that feedback with the team. They worked very hard on the all of the CKLA work and continue. 
through implementation. Rob, did you have anything? I don't want to put you on the spot. No. Um, just with the fast bridge thing, is that something that we, like, is there a better tool out there to use? Or? Fast bridge is great and, and, and gives us a lot of information from a screening standpoint. The idea is to make sure that if there are kids who are below certain percentiles that we're making sure they're getting the help they need. And FastBridge does exactly that three times a year. Okay. It's just when we're thinking about how our kids are doing on the standards, that's not that assessment's job. There are other assessments, including um, the curriculum-based assessments, if that makes sense. From an analogy standpoint, you can't tell if a child has diabetes by weighing them, but if they're overweight or underweight on this on that screening when they come into the doctor's office, then you dig deeper. Um, whereas blood tests will tell you the answers to that, and so the screeners are quick um, opportunities to say, do we have kids that might be having some significant problems that we need to address further? Whereas the curriculum-based measures are uh, telling us how are they achieving in the in the areas that they're being provided instruction on. So. Um, a screener is like getting weighed, and the curriculum-based measure or the curriculum-based measures, meaning the tests and assessments with the curriculum, are going to give us more accurate achievement data. That was a great analogy. I'm stealing that. that Dr. Major, so I'm like, that's yes, really that good. Very good. <laughs> so one thing. One, oh, go ahead. Question though, too, with um, the CKLA curriculum, I thought someone had mentioned at some point that we were given like online like additional access for the we teachers were. free of charge because the teachers had implemented it so well yeah so we um because we are a model district and several people have come through our doors we have um been afforded a five six actually f six years of student facing free um interface which would cost one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and we were given to it free for our strong implementation. Excellent. My, my question, oh, go ahead. Oh, Do you, okay, th then that was an excellent question. I, I've been in contact with WASB ever since this whole Act 20 was being discussed, and my biggest concern was we were, we were ahead of the curve, and we are ahead of the curve, and so I didn't want to miss out on that money. And so that has been a question I've been asking right from the get-go to make sure that just because we implement it doesn't mean we're going to miss. My question is, um, is there a cap amount? Like, are we going to get that 50% back likely, or are, is there a cap amount for the we don't whole know. state? We don't, we don't know that yet. Okay. We're going to, our goal is to be one of the first to apply for yep. the money um, to make sure that that happens. But we, who knows what's going to happen. And that's how yeah, Unless Jonathan that's knows how something I don't know. These things work a lot of times is it's almost like a grant and who gets there first. And so, Jonathan, I don't know if you have anything to say. We don't know exactly how much, but we entered into a loan structure that allows for prepayment for this scenario. So we'll okay. wait for the money and then whatever we do receive up to 50% we can utilize right away rather than accruing that interest that will provide some relief on the budget in future years if it's a significant amount. So are we in the process of applying right now? We can't because or they have not provided the process yet. Okay. So we're delayed about three months already. We okay, were told right. by January 1st we were going to be able to do this. So we are um, anxiously awaiting that opportunity. So I'll just ask on behalf of the board, and I know you guys will keep us in the loop. Just let us know when that where we're at. Absolutely, we'll keep you mm -hmm. abreast of that Thank situation. You. In order to I'll be move, eligible, yeah, we need to move approval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need approval. So yeah. Yeah. we approval. recommend approval. Yep. Any other questions? If not, I'll look for a motion to approve. Uh, I'll move approval of agenda item four point two, the ELA um, CKLA uh, reading curriculum. I'll second. So we do have a motion and a second to approve our English language arts curriculum in item 4.2. Any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, motion carries. Thank you guys for your hard work in this area. Uh, we're moving on to new business, and this one is very interesting to me personally. Um, 5.1 deals with English Learner Program update, and we got a nice report on this. Dr. Midzik, I'll turn it over to you. So Ms. Ledesma has two groups that she brought with her tonight. So the first report is our English Language Learners, and you can go ahead and introduce them. Okay. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to kick the presentation off. So as you mentioned, there is a board report. That board report really hits some of the background. It provides that federal, state, and local guidelines uh, for why we provide these services. 
a little bit about the identification process, some data related to the students served, the staffing, and then some information around our service delivery model and our continuous improvement work. What we want this afternoon to be is really an opportunity to elevate student voice um, and staff voice around the impact of our programming. So with that, um, we want to start by grounding ourselves in this belief that here in Greendale, we make sure that as we design our program, we, programming here in the district, we design it to the margins, um, making sure that we're able to meet the needs of all learners in the district, including some of our special populations. Tonight, you'll hear a little bit about our English language learner program. You'll also hear us use um, other terminology and all those terms are interchangeable. So either English learner programming or multilingual um, learners and that's just a shift on the national level around how we um, refer to this group of students. This helps us ultimately to fulfill our district vision of cultivating excellence in every student. We know um, that our students may require this additional service to reach their full potential, and as well as being able to learn, belong, and grow here in the district. So a little bit about our multilingual learners. Um, it's important to know that these students are working towards proficiency in academic English, as well as towards the academic standards. So everything that we talked about this afternoon, our programming when it comes to clubs and extracurriculars, our students are participating with that. In that, they're receiving the strong universal instruction that CKLA offers, um, as well as gaining that academic proficiency. Our students come to us with very rich and unique life experiences, um, and that is something that we build on as an asset and celebrate multilingualism in our schools. They also come with varied linguistic, academic, and social emotional needs. So we're serving students who might be um, recently arrived in our country or our schools as a newcomer all the way up to students who have gained a high level of proficiency in English and on the standards and we're simply monitoring them. Uh, we'll have our English language teachers talk a little bit tonight about some of the work that they do to support our students as well as build capacity and share their expertise with their colleagues and all the other educators in the district. So. Um, one other thing to note, these are legally required services, which I detailed in the report, and we know that they're vital for our students. I wanted to share just a little bit of data before I toss it off. It, this is about 6% of our total population of students. So uh, based on the third Friday in September, that would have been about 148 students out of 2,606. We have over 28 languages spoken in Greendale based on the home language survey. And you can see the top languages spoken there. So the top five, English being number one, followed by Arabic, Spanish, Serbian, and Urdu. So with that, I'm going to invite our English language teachers up to the podium. And they are going to share some of our student voices, and they'll share some beautiful stories with us. And I want to welcome all three of you, and thank you especially because you've been here for a long time tonight. I do want to let our student board members know it's getting close to 9 o'clock, so if you need to leave at 9, you're welcome to do so and be excused. But thank you for being patient and waiting through this uh, long day, I'm sure, for you. Thank you for being with us. Hi, thank you. I'm Sarah Shelp, and I'm with Dana Evers and Renee Budo. Um, good evening. We're here to talk to you tonight about the Multilingual Learner Program Evolution and the impact it has on all students over the years. As you can see, this is a roadmap. Um, we started off with only one English language teacher in the early 2000s, uh, serving all of our students across the district in all three elementaries, middle, the middle and the high school building. Um, this provided the bare minimum in terms of support with access testing, which is a mandated testing, taking precedent, and then minimal check-ins with staff and students. In recent years, with the growth of our English learner population, we have acquired additional staff who have remained a constant over the last 10 years. Our 
Our team has grown significantly, and we now consist of six EL teachers. We always put the needs of our language learners at the forefront of our planning, instruction, and assessments. We have developed a co-plan to co-serve model. So on this slide, if you look all the way to the right, where we are now, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, the model of services that we're providing now. And um, a co-plan to co-serve model means that we regularly collaborate with teachers in order to provide language strategies as well as strong tier one instructional tools and supports as this curriculum makes, or I'm sorry, as this work makes curriculum accessible to all students. We have also been able to co-teach in several content area classes, and this allows us to have two active teacher leaders in the classroom, as well as two people to work with flexible groupings of students. This, mo this model has allowed us to create an inclusive environment for students, um, where language instruction is embedded into standards-based curriculum. If you could go to the next slide, please, Rachel. Okay. Um, our current model of instruction has worked well over the years. However, there are still many areas we can improve upon, um, such as our collaboration with teachers, the continued use of data to inform our instructional practices, and the focus on the district's goal of equitable educational opportunities for all learners. As we look ahead, we will continue to improve our practices in alignment with our multi-level system of support. This allows us to analyze data um, when we are creating a flexible approach to provide intervention and support services in addition to language services. We are excited to continue to build capacity around this work while we provide multilingual students with enriching equitable educational experiences here in Greendale. And now Renee will talk a little bit about the impact our program has had on our students, families, and community. Good, ev good evening, everybody. My name is Renee Bodeau, and I am uh, proud to be uh, 18 years in the district serving our English learners. I'm also uh, the wife of an immigrant, and I'm the mother of two bilingual, bicultural kiddos here in the district, a middle schooler and a high schooler. So uh, very proud to have that as part of my uh, resume as well. So I, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about how our program has really touched the lives of students, families, and our fellow educators in the district. So we have a couple of examples of elementary kiddos. Um, our first example is a fourth grader who came from China last May, so really um, still quite a newcomer. The only thing she knew at that time were the names of the letters in English, not even the sounds that the letters make. Can I um, pause for a second? Sorry, what? Pardon? What? Okay, for the, the volume, I'm just wondering about student confidentiality because this is going out on YouTube. Oh, the whole, I don't know. We did get approval from the family. Okay, thank you. So, yep, so <laughs> okay. I will just share that for all of the student stories that we're sharing, um, I did double check with the teachers, and the teachers <laughs> did share that this will be presented at a board meeting. So okay. I hope that's okay to proceed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank sure you. we had parent permission we to share. Thank you. We did double check ahead of thanks time. Thanks for checking, and thanks yep. for knowing that. <laughs> and with the teacher. Great. Okay, so our first kiddo, um, as we said, she came last May from China, uh, knew only the names of the letters, um, and now she can read simple books about fourth grade topics. So um, wow. these, these elementary videos are a bit longer, so if you just want to play a few seconds of them. Um, our first kiddo on the left, if you could click on that one. No, okay. And she's with her teacher. Yeah. What is a volcano? Volcanoes are openings in the Earth's surface. surface. They let hot lava rocks, gas, and ash into the air. Some volcanoes look like mountains, others are flat and low. Some volcanoes are under the ocean. Where volcanoes form? So her and the teacher are reading back and forth. Mm -hmm. Is that the CKLA? Do they use that? The next that video come? is actually CKLA. 
Um, so as you can see, after less than a year in the country, she's already wow. reading. She's not on grade level yet, Shocking. but she's reading about grade level topics, That's and great. she's really coming up very nicely. We're really very proud. Um, our second kiddo is, let me flip this over here, uh, a first grader who came from Vietnam in the fall of 2022 um, in kindergarten, and she spoke no English at all at the beginning of kindergarten, and she really struggled with her literacy all the way through kindergarten, was not on grade level at the end of kindergarten. And now here she is in first grade, and she is now reading uh, at completely at grade level. Um, so take a look at this student. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning. You're going to do a little reading for us today? Yeah. Excellent. You may start. Trips. Next. See, next. Let's see the trips. We have ten trips here at the Green Brown Zoo. You can see them out all out there. If you look hard. And then if you could just fast forward to 1 minute 25, she asks her some impromptu questions. to get it exact. There you go. Okay. Jennifer, um, tell me three things you really like about school. Um, doing art at the um, art room uh -huh. and reading at the library and writing about weekends. Oh, so wonderful. Right. Thanks for talking with me today, Jennifer. Amazing. So it's yeah, that's amazing. really amazing. That's good. Yeah, the that's progress. Good. Um, and then in the next slide, we have some more okay. high school okay. students. <laughs> it's hard to control these things. Um, and in the next slide, we have some of our Good morning, high Jennifer. School, Good morning. Uh, You're going to do a little. You have to keep hitting it, it quickly. I think I'm just going to do it. Just this go to it. Yep, there you go. So we're going to let the high school uh, multilingual learners speak for themselves. Hello, my name is Saja. Hello, my name is Lena. I'm from Jordan. I'm from Tunisia. I speak Arabic and English. I speak Arabic, French, and English. I came to the U.S. in 2019. I came here in 2018. Getting support from my teacher helped me get better at my English, especially at first when I didn't know much English. Teacher ha had helped me with my homeworks and understanding the things I didn't fully understand. Getting support from the English language department helped me as a student. I was able to learn the correct grammar and phrasing. I got help with reading, writing, and speaking, which helped me communicate a lot better, both inside and outside of school. After I graduate this year, I'm planning to going to college. After I graduate, I'm also planning to going to college for a business major. Fun fact about me, I came here to the U.S. by winning the DV lottery. A fun fact about me is that I just got my citizenship a few weeks ago. She got. I think we have uh, a couple more slides of some short high schoolers. Wait, wait. Really short, like 30 seconds. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Francis Bonilla. I'm from Nicaragua. I speak Spanish and English. I came to Greenville in 2023. Grading support for the English language department helped me as a student because I'm a new English learner. In the future, I'm planning to go to college. Harvard, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have one more student. It's just an audio recording. Sadak. My name is Sadak. I'm from Tunisia. I speak Arabic. My name is Sadak. I'm from Tunisia. I speak Arabic, French, and English. I came to Greendale from Tunisia in 2021 when I was a sophomore in high school. Getting support from the English language department helped me a lot as a student because it, deep, it deepened my understanding of the classes I took and improved my communication with the rest of the GHS community, which increased my sense of belonging. In the future, I'm planning to become a biological researcher in order to help humankind. Wow, that's amazing. So we're very proud of our students. Yeah, you should be. That's amazing. Um, a couple of more things we wanted to share with you. Um, we, got, we asked our families and our colleagues to make some comments about how the EL program has impacted them. Um, and we got so many wonderful comments, but we just pulled out a couple that had some common themes in them. So in this one, you all can just see that the family share that they arrived in the U.S. without knowing English at the time, academic English. 
and their progress has been quite considerable um, since that time. And the parents share that now their child can communicate with friends and teachers and they're learning how to read and write um, in English and making progress towards the standards. And then we also pulled out um, a comment from a colleague just talking about how the multilingual teachers play an integral role in all facets of instruction. They're helping with universal design solutions for all students. Um, they're engaged in that team approach and then their access to all educators and all students. Thank you. And before I go, I just wanted to um, thank you, say thank you to Rachel. She's been a very wonderful leader and support to us. And we're going to miss you a lot when you go, but we still have some time together. <laughs> and welcome to Denise. We're so, so glad that you're going to be on our team. So thank you so much. Very nice. And then the final piece we wanted to highlight around continuous improvement is that this year we're really continuing to focus on family engagement and we'll be hosting a multilingual family night on May the 2nd. That will be an opportunity for us to share information with our families about additional ways that they can support their children's learning as well as gather feedback from our families around what additional supports and resources or opportunities for collaboration that they're looking for. Um, and you can see the flyer depicted on the side here. So. That would be great um, to maybe get on the, the village marquee right at the corner of uh, Grange, if possible, to let the community know. I think that would be the village is up for that. We'll try to see if we can make that happen. All right. So we are at the point of questions. I want to, first of all, thank you all for just sharing the highlights of these students. I mean, the work you do is um, amazing. I mean, you, you take students that come to our schools, to our country, without being able to speak English or even, as some of you said, read English. And by the time they're leaving us, they're, they're talking about their futures in college and beyond. So I really want to thank you. Um, I, my hat goes off to EL or ML or however, whatever the title is going to be now. Um, I work with several students in my school that have se second languages as well. And the work that you all do one-on-one -on -one with these students is just amazing. Um, we heard from some of the students. I want to see if any of the board members have questions, but I um, just, again, want to highlight um, that people don't understand always that there are 28 languages spoken in Greendale and probably even more that we know of or that we don't know of. Um, so I think that's just something that people don't necessarily think when they come to a suburb like Greendale. So um, go ahead, board, please. Anyone have any comments or questions? I was Joel? just going to thank you. I, um, you know, I said earlier how Greendale and its staff uh, and, and, and you um, keep students, you know, keep that student focus, that student centered um, at the center of all our, our decision making. And I think it, it, it's great because otherwise it's too easy to try to, you know, here's a cost and let's have savings here and, and why are we spending money here? And yes, it's a state mandate and it's legally required, but it's an investment. I mean, you saw the opportunity and the investment that we're making in these these young students and um, what an investment it is in their lives and and you know you hear about you know some of their wants and needs and desires um, going forward and, and you're making it happen you're helping them realize their dreams so thank you excellent Mary? I, I was just going to add that I I think um, the old term ESL uh, so the new term is ML multiple languages so um, I think most people um, don't realize that you can take anyone from any language, right? The program, the way the program works, it, it's, it, it, you don't have to speak Arabic in order to teach it or Urdu or even Spanish, but I'm sure you've picked up some words over the years in, in those languages. So, um, and what a great way to um, you know, help a child feel welcome as they're you know, learning a language. So. Uh, in, in a foreign country so and then that one student who got their citizenship I'm sure you were part of that as well so I'm really impressed with your program others uh, Natasha or? Oh, I just want to say thanks for all your hard work and um, I just think the, the kids are like sponges at a young age and they just learn other languages so 
readily, and I think they're they're just doing a great job. Bob, anything? I'll just echo what Tasha said. It's fantastic to see. The one question I have for you, um, there's obviously parent-teacher conferences and opportunities for parents to come in and learn how their children are learning. Um, there's obviously no way we can have 28 different uh, language speakers. So how does that work in Greendale schools? Do we have interpreters at all? Are, are the parents bilingual? Um, so how, how do we address those situations so that parents can have conversations with their educators? I'll just start by saying that if um, families or anyone needs language assistance, we do offer that in our district. So we have different, um, well, we have a group of internal staff that we can call on that have the appropriate training to serve as an interpreter. But then we also have third party vendors that we'll utilize if we need to, to support around language assistance. So we have a, a process and a procedure for that. I can talk a little bit more about that because we did have conferences in February mm -hmm. and one of our students, um, his mother spoke Chin, which is a very rare language and so we used Language Line and we were able to call during the conference and the translator was available and she was able to express her concerns for her son nice. and understand um, what was going on in classes and ways that she could support him. So even though the language was definitely not something you know, we had in-house, we were definitely able to help her and support her with that. Excellent. And the benefits for all of our students to have these multilingual students, I, I think that goes beyond words, but I don't know if any of you want to touch on that. I, I think students are learning from other students, and, and we talk about acceptance and belonging. Uh, one, of, one or two of those students actually talked about uh, feeling like they belong. So I don't know if you want to touch on that. Yeah, I'll just say that um, our multilingual students are just like any other student um, that comes here to Greendale. They participate in the curriculum. They um, want to belong. They want to have friends. They come with a wealth of life experiences and assets that we have an opportunity to build on and support them with their goals. So I think that's really important to recognize. Um, also, our multilingual learners oftentimes they're dealing with two languages at one time so there's lots of cognitive flexibility there and things that they can offer to the classroom environment around problem solving and bringing a global perspective and a different lens when we're thinking about issues or topics in the classroom so definitely an asset definitely um, helping to enrich our classroom environment and bring just another level of diversity. So I'll just mm -hmm. say that. Um, I always think about every student has a need and a story and every teacher has knowledge and expertise to kind of tailor instruction, provide support so that students can achieve their full potential. Excellent, and can you highlight when the, uh, what is the event called again and when is it being held and where? Yes, so it is our multilingual family night. It is on May the 2nd. It will be at the Greendale Public Library. There will be information about the seal of biliteracy, um, technology tools that we use in our schools, ways to build literacy skills at home, and then we'll also be providing some additional resources. The library will share some information around the resources and programming that they offer, as well as Park and Rec. Yes, and what time was that? That is at 5 to 7 five Yeah. To seven. Thank you. May the 2nd. All right. Thank you all for being here tonight in your years. And I'm, I'm glad um, I, one of you, I, um, I'm going to get the names mixed up, Sarah in the blue, right? Um, so when you mentioned your six of you, because I know we see 5.8, but I really like the fact that you highlighted that there are six of you because there are six of you that are making this program possible for our students. So I just want to thank all of you and your colleagues who are not here tonight. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we're going to move on to 5.2, which is our special education program update. Dr. Midzik? 
or um, Rachel, I should say, probably. Sure. I'll go ahead with that. So again, you received a detailed report or memo as part of your board packet around our special education programming in the district. We bring this update to you all every two years. The last time we shared um, just more of the technical aspects of the programming. I actually provided that in the memo this time, giving you that background information about the legal requirements related to special education, a little bit of data around the students served, staffing, and then I also provided you with information around our continuum of special education services and what we're providing and working with staff on around professional development and continuous improvement. So with that, I'm going to invite um, some of our program support team members up to the podium. And we already kind of covered this, but we continue to design our programming to the margin to make sure that we meet the needs of all learners, including special, po special populations. So when we think about special education services in the district, we're talking about students who have went through an evaluation process and they're found to be eligible for special education services in one of the 12 disability areas um, here in Wisconsin. Our students, again, have varied needs and those needs can range from academic to social emotional to even physical um, needs. Really a point of pride, the vast majority of our students participate in the general education curriculum. So these services are in addition to their gener general education programming that they receive. And we use inclusive practices. I said every student has a story and a need. It, we also have teachers that have the expertise and the knowledge. So our special education teachers are designing accommodations and modifications, as well as delivering specially designed instruction so that our students can access and make progress in the general education curriculum and on their IEP goals. So um, that's a little bit around the special education programming. And we are going to elevate student voice and staff voice and the impact of our programming. So with that, I'll invite our program support teachers up. And I want to thank all of you for being here for a very long meeting. I know it's Monday and it's a long day, so thank you for joining us tonight. All right. Um, a little bit of special education by the numbers. So we currently serve about 13.2% of our total population being students with disabilities or students receiving special education services. We currently service um, out of those 12 areas. We have students that qualify for services out of 10 of those areas. Um, so you can see the wide variety of need we have based on that. And then that means that we need to have a really broad continuum of special education services. So this graphic just shows that we can move across our continuum and wrap services around students based on what they need. Hi everyone, my name is Nikki Orloff and I am um, the behavior support specialist in the district. Prior to this role, I've been a special education teacher here in Greendale since 2005, being at the middle school for one year and primarily at College Park the other. Um, so in this role, um, as behavior support teacher and um, working with our program support team. This past October and November, it was um, bully prevention um, month. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that we've done to support ability awareness and bullying prevention. Some of this work actually came from a group of parents who brought their concerns to the district um, around their students with special education needs. They brought their concerns and their lived experiences around bully prevention to us as a district. And so um, at the elementary level, Rachel, Denise, and I talked about how we could um, take their concerns and make some action steps to address some of the things that they brought to us. 
And so what we did is we looked for a book that we thought encompassed talking about different abilities and um, inclusion. And we chose the book Just Ask by Sonia Sotomayor. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we created a lesson for all elementary teachers to deliver to their classrooms in kindergarten through grade five. Um, and we did that using a slideshow we incorporated um, a lesson plan for each classroom. And what we did is we selected different um, staff members throughout the district to read excerpts of the book. And so kids got to see different staff members throughout the district reading the book. And then we had a lesson that went along with that. The book overall talks about different abilities that um, everyone has and tools and strategies that we use to help us. Um, so you're going to see in the next slide, there's an example of what that kind of looked like for, um, for the classroom. So this um, part of the book was read by Mr. Bob, who's a custodian at Highland View. Mm -hmm. We chose, we really were thoughtful. We wanted to um, have the kids see all different types of people that work in our district, whether that be teachers, administrators, paraprofessionals, custodians, um, just really to really show the kids how everybody is important to our district. So we're, I'm just going to play a quick um, little snippet of Mr. Bob reading this part of the story so you can get a feel of what that slideshow looked like. I do. My name is Raphael and I have asthma, which means I sometimes have trouble breathing. And when that happens, I take a break and use an inhaler with medicine to make breathing easier. Quiet time helps me slow down and catch my breath. My inhaler is like a tool to help my body. Do you use a tool to help your body? So then the book goes on with different staff members reading the different characters and the different... I do. Um, my name is Raphael and I have The different tools that which, they use. Um, so going on to the next slide, you're going to see a variety of pictures here. And so in October, everybody, um, all the classroom teachers presented the lesson. And then in November, we had school-wide assemblies in all three schools. And so um, Denise and I worked with pupil service team members to go out to the schools and really deliver a message about anti-bullying and how to be an upstander. We brought the book back and said, what did you remember from the book Just Ask? And they talked about how everybody has some, you know, everybody has different tools and strategies that they use. And so um, you can see from the pictures that the students were really engaged in the work and remembering the book. And then at the top right, you can see a banner that every student at the elementary um, schools signed, and that was really revolving around to be an upstander and to, um, which was addressing that anti bullying message. So those were presented in November at all three elementary schools. Moving on to the next slide, so now, so that was in the fall, um, and then now March and April, like we heard, our Ability Awareness and Acceptance Months. So what I thought was really cool was Katie Keist at the high school reached out to me and she said that at the high school level, they wanted to use that book Just Ask as well. And so they used it using some of their students um, with different abilities to read the story and kind of did some of a, of a similar activity, but yet a little different. They also had an inclusion week, which you can see there, to um, celebrate diversity and, um, and inclusion as well. So I thought it would just be cool for you to see. This is a, a longer um, video of the high school just asked, but if you get a chance, I would really encourage you to watch the entire thing because it's really cool. So we're just gonna share just the intro um, by two of those students. During the week of March 4th to 8th is Spread the Word Inclusion Month. Greendale High School students are going to come together to read a story to you about inclusion, acceptance, and belonging. No matter your ability, everyone deserves to feel respected. JHS is proud to promote inclusion of everyone. Enjoy the book Just Asked by Sonia Sotomayor as students read aloud to you the story of being different, being brave, and being you. 
So we thought it was a really cool book to use, and it ended up um, pretty much throughout the district being used. So that was really, really cool. And again, that work got brought to us from concerns of um, parents, and we ran with it and um, really did our best to um, you know, address some of those concerns. Um, so that happened at the high school, middle school, and high school level. At the elementary level, um, what we did to, to uh, um, kind of celebrate the ability, awareness, and acceptance months is each elementary school has a bulletin board, the ABCs of Ability, Awareness, and Acceptance, which tie in some of the themes and some of the terms from the Just Ask book. And then on that slideshow on the right, we have about 15 announcements throughout the months of March and April that talk about all different abilities. So the one featured there was for February 29th, Rare Disease Day. And then there were other um, announcements that were made and that will be made throughout the month, throughout the rest of this month and some of um, April, because April, as we know, is Autism Acceptance and Awareness Month. And so just highlighting different abilities. I had a teacher reach out to me that um, one of the announcements talked about how the creator of Pokemon actually had autism and one one of the um, students in her class, like she clapped and talked about how her brother also had autism and how it was really impactful and nice to hear an announcement um, recognizing and celebrating that diversity. So that was a really cool um, way to just kind of wrap up all of the, not wrap up, but to address and, and to celebrate ability awareness. The next um, thing I'm going to talk to you about is our ES3 grant. If you're wondering what ES3 is, it's Enhancing Social and Emotional Skills in Students with IEPs. Two years ago, Rachel said, Nikki, let's write a grant. And um, it was a statewide grant, which I hadn't had any experience in. Um, so it was a really great learning opportunity for me. And from that, a lot of really positive things have come about with the ES3 grant. It's a three-year process. Greendale is in year two right now of that grant. Um, and so really the whole goal of it is to provide um, structures, to put systems in place for our students around our beliefs, systems, um, and skills, and really it's to improve student outcomes. So that is really just a quick overview of the grant. And then on the next slide, it kind of we I'll talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the action items that we've done through the ES3 grant. So um, the first one talks about we coach teams at the elementary, middle, and high school level. So this is really focusing on students that have diverse social and emotional needs. And so we coach teams around different strategies and, and trying to improve outcomes, as well as building staff capacity um, to work with some of our more challenging students. We have an ES3 core team that meets monthly. And what we do um, in those meetings, we are actually this year participating in a book club. And our book is called Happy Kids Don't Punch You in the Face, mm -hmm. which um, we've had a lot of really great discussions and action items um, about. And again, we, this grant really targets those students with diverse social and emotional needs. So that has been really great. We've also been focused on family engagement. We've had a partnership with WISPI, which is the Wisconsin Statewide Parent Educator Initiative. Um, Sherry Silla is the coordinator for, um, for WISPI, so she's come to talk to our ES3 core team about family engagement and things that we can do to increase our relationships with our families here in Greendale. Um, and then another thing that ES3 has really helped us with is our inclusion work in our district-sponsored events. So you heard Rachel talk a little bit about um, events that we're having throughout the district. Um, one of the examples that we've, two of the examples that we've already um, done this year is one in our Hispanic Heritage Night. We provided a sensory-friendly um, aspect of that night so that our families with students can come and if it's a little too loud or you know they just need kind of a break that we had a room set up with different sensory um, items some quiet coloring it was staffed by um, one of our special education teachers and so that provided some families a place to go because sometimes our events right can be um, a little overwhelming they can be loud and so um, having 
us participate in these events are helping with our whole idea of being inclusive. And then as we talked about before, um, our seat families have really talked about wanting us to create activities for, um, for, for them as well. So we had a sensory friendly family night and that like I think you had talked about that. Those are really cool events that families come to. They bring their children. Um, we have different stations throughout the spaces that we're using and um, we're really proud of that work as well. I think it's really great for the families too to know they're not in it alone and those events really just boost everyone I think so and it helps connect families with each other absolutely which we've heard lots of positive feedback around as well so that has been really successful and very impactful for us as well right. All right, so we wanted to talk a little bit about Wendy Weber. She is our WISPI Family Engagement Liaison. So three years ago, the district was in need of a new liaison. I reached out to the administrative team to see if they had parents that they could recommend for this. And then based on those recommendations, we met as a program support team and then started to reach out to parents to see if they were interested. When I talked to Wendy, she was thrilled that two different administrators um, nominated her per se, and um, was really excited to take this on. She went to all of the training and has been very active in our seat activities, as well as meeting with Rachel on a regular basis. And I think she's done a great job reaching out to families. In the past, we haven't had as much need for that engagement liaison. Families weren't really reaching out, but now that Wendy has taken over, I think that's increased. And overall, I just think our overall communication has increased so much between staff, the liaison, and um, our families. So Rachel will play a clip so you can learn a little bit more about Wendy and her role. Hi, my name is Wendy Weber. I am the District Family Engagement Liaison for Greendale School District. I've been in this role since about September of 2021, and I've also been a resident of Greendale for over 20 years. I have two children, both of which have been in Greendale School District their entire academic career, a neurotypical daughter who is a sophomore at Greendale High School, and my son who is on the autism spectrum in eighth grade at Greendale Middle School. As a part of this role, I received training early on from our WISPI partners, otherwise known as the Wisconsin Statewide Parent Educator Initiative. In addition to the early on training, I also attend monthly calls with other WISPI partners and DFEL liaisons throughout the state of Wisconsin. In both the training and the calls, I receive valuable information and resources to be able to share widely throughout the district. In addition to my WISPI training and calls, I've worked very closely with Rachel Ledesma, the Director of Pupil Services at Greendale School District. Rachel and I have monthly check-ins to talk about the different initiatives or issues that are facing some of our families in the district. I've helped provide resources and even my candid feedback on situations that have come up throughout my time in the DFEL role, trying to bridge the gap between the school district and our parents. In addition to some of those activities, I've also worked with Rachel Ledesma to create our special education advisory team within Greendale School District, otherwise known as SEAT. Our SEAT team is a combination of not only district staff, myself, but also parents of special needs children throughout the district, or even supporters or key stakeholders that really have a vested interest in the success of these children. At the SEAT meetings, we talk about issues that are currently facing children at a high level, or even brainstorm some things that we could do differently going forward, such as changes made to how we plan transitions from elementary to middle or middle to high school, as well as coordinating several all-inclusive events that are much more comfortable for our children that are neurodiverse. My time in the DFEL role has been very fulfilling and I'm very grateful for the Greendale School District for offering me this opportunity. I look forward to continuing to serve in the role in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Wendy. Okay, I think they saved the very best pictures for last. So um, I'm Nikki Tim, and I'm a program support specialist for middle school, high school, 
and then 18 and beyond. So that's where we're going to focus a little bit of our time here. Um, so I just want to show you these pictures. Um, we're going to go back about 15 years. So these pictures um, were from 15 years ago. And it's really dear to my heart because, well, I've been in the district 23 years. And um, three of those students I had in 5K. And um, one of the students, Nikki Ortloff, also had in 5K. So these students have been with us all the way through their journey from 5K and then 12th grade. Um, and they needed some extra transitional support. Um, and so we have a program. Um, we call it Summit Place. And it is um, housed at the Greenbelt um, Apartments the last three years. It's, it's been a really wonderful experience for these students. And they've, they've grown and, and um, really become wonderful young adults. Um, some of the programming um, we have is, is very community-based. So um, they've worked at places like Harbor Village. Um, uh, we have Goodwill and YMCA. So they've had some really great experiences. Um, and we're able to learn more independent skills, living skills, and kind of figure out what they were going to do post-secondary. And um, if we can look at our next picture, we'll kind of see. Um, we have quite a few students that are going to be leaving and aging out um, because they are 21. So we have some of our students um, are employed, um, fresh time. Um, and you can see someone's at Meyer. Um, we have some going to the zoo, um, Project Search. And um, we have one of our students that's going to continue on at Summit Place next year. And um, we have another one that is um, going to Children's Hospital through Project Search. And another one that's working here pretty locally at uh, Culver's. And he's, that's pretty much his dream job. So <laughs> he's really excited. And um, um, Anna there um, also would really very much like to be at Culver's as well. So that's one of her. She was at senior night at the <laughs> theater last week. Was she? Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, we're really excited um, about our programming. It's, it's amazing to just see the journey of our students and what an impact our program is making and how much of a part these students are in our community and um, giving back to the schools and giving back to the community. So we're really proud of them and the places that they're going. And, you know, we want to thank everybody for the support. And I guess I hope you enjoyed the journey of 5K through um, all the way to 18 and beyond to 21. So. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, they're, they're the reason we're here. And thank you um, for sharing the highlights of all the, the work that you guys do, the great work. I'm going to turn it over to board members if anyone has any questions or comments for our very dedicated staff who have stayed here very late tonight. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, it, what, uh, anybody who's still with us uh, listening or who watches this meeting, how wonderful that we could see the the full bell curve, right, in public education from a perfect score on the ACT to some of our um, special education students and, and everyone in between. So uh, it's just such a testimony that, um, that public, in public ed, you know, we, we take everybody and we do, we, t we meet them where they're at and move them forward. So thank you for just showing the faces, I think, and the names, putting names and faces. Um, to your students. Um, I did have a question about the, um, because of the public comment, um, someone earlier spoke about the bullying, how it, the, the program came out of um, special education parents, but then it looks like it was something that grew to be a school-wide, district-wide program. Um, if, if, I don't know if Dr. Mitzik wants to talk to that, or, and then along with address a, just in general, I know you can't speak um, in specifics, but what are some of the consequences that come with bullying, um, people who are not uh, following bullying policies? Dr. Mizik, I can speak a little bit to this work, and then maybe if you want to take the second half. So I'll just say 
that around the bullying prevention and ability awareness, it's important to know that we do have a plan already. Um, so we had these families come to us with some feedback. They actually presented an organization that could provide um, some training and assemblies. And through conversation with that fam those families, we felt like it was important to build on the work that we already have in place here and for our staff to lead some of that work. So that's where that collaboration with our special education staff, our pupil services team who have that training as mental health providers and helping with systems work actually work to enhance our plan. So we had a teaching component, which you heard about earlier, that was the classroom lessons, and then the assemblies, which really works in tandem with everything that we're doing. So when we think about Character Strong as our universal social emotional learning curriculum and our character um, curriculum, when we think about programs like Sources of Strength, PBIS, we felt like it was an opportunity to just strengthen the existing work. So I just want to be clear that we already have systems and structures in place, but this was an opportunity to hear parent voices, elevate those voices, and enhance our systems. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, it's part of our the Character Strong curriculum that you approved, and we have gone above and beyond that uh, in addressing, sit, we talk about the data, and when we see data that uh, says there's a system-wide concern, then we bring that into the system-wide um, solution. And so at the middle school, there has been some work that has been done there. Uh, and we specifically had a, a lesson during advisory that was led by a Mr. Curry uh, that talked about some of the behaviors that constitute bullying, some of the concerning behaviors that we've been seeing, and some of the concerning um, what is hate speech and what does that look like, and then spent some time talking about how all students um, contribute to that climate and how they can be upstanders, what things they can do to disrupt or interrupt some of those things that are happening and how to report it and how to conf how to either confront it or report it so that they can get help. Um, so they there's been some general curriculum that's universal and then when we see problems in the data there are additional presentations and um, instruction that is happening to reteach or um, pre-teach some of the things that are happening and and what all students can do, not just the ones who are engaged in the activity. The only thing I want to add, uh, Dr. Midget, is just around, um, we also were very clear about boundaries and consequences for um, bullying and hate speech with students as well, um, because we know that kids need to be, kids need to learn from their mistakes, but also part of that is having a consequence, and that is part of um, what the middle school and all of our schools are making sure that our kids are being held accountable and that they're learning from their mistakes because that we are at the heart of who we are. We're a learning place. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Um, Joe? Just, one, oh. just one more thing. I'm sorry, Joe. Um, I just wanted to say to the special education teachers, um, I, I remember very clearly when I was a young teacher asking a special education teacher on staff about a student in my classroom and I, I asked, well, what's the student's greatest potential? And the special, the special education teacher kind of stared me down and was like, I, I don't know, what's your greatest potential? You know, so the, just the thought of how, you know, you, you, the special education teachers are just really just, I mean, obviously special in and of themselves because they're dealing with such a special population. So i um, really grateful that you stayed this long and presented your program. Joe? Uh, th thank you um, for, for sharing your, your stories and sharing the work that you're doing. Uh, my one question, I think I, we saw a slide, and I think if I, if I saw correctly, one of the students was in a, an athletic uniform. Um, and I do recall hearing, you know, having a conversation with a mom um, who, whose student was up there about how her son was participating in marching band a few years ago and, and what a joy it was to see him perform with his older sister um, because she never expected her two children to be able to perform in um, co-curricular activities together. So I guess that, that's my question is what type of opportunities do um, our, our special education students have maybe outside of the classroom? Um, and 
um, how do we engage uh, with activities and athletics and things like that um, so that uh, our students have that full experience that is so so needed in, at the high school age or at the uh, I'll speak to that so um, I think it's important to just ground ourselves in the concept that the vast majority of our students are educated in the general education curriculum and we, our job as special educators is to provide access into that curriculum and environment. So that means any classroom setting that you can think about, any activity, any club, um, that is a skill of our special educators. They're adapters, right? Like we think about them as adaptation specialists. So if there's an opportunity and there's a student need, our special educators are there to tailor that program, that club, that opportunity, so that our students can gain access into it by providing accommodations and modifications, and sometimes specially designed instruction, or all the time specially designed instruction. But when I think about um, activities, they're working collaboratively with the staff, with the student, to provide accommodations and modifications so that students can have full participation. Is that helpful? Yep. Okay. Thank you. I have uh, two things. One, our students with 504 plans, are they included in that 13.2% or is that, or is that an addition to the 13.2% that are identified as special ed in the district? That would be separate. That so would when be we're separate. thinking about our students with 504s, those are students um, who have been identified with a disability and they're receiving accommodations um, so that they can gain access versus our students with IEPs, same thing, they've been identified as a student with a disability under the 12 categories that we have, and I always struggle to even say that right. word disability, but that's the legal term. Um, so they've been identified and they've met criteria in one of those 12 areas, and they require specially designed instruction. So that adaptation specialist that is working with staff, working with the student, to um, design that access so that they can engage and make progress. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, well, we all as a board have received an invite from Catherine Keast um, to the exit ceremony on May 30th, I believe. I, I regret personally I will not probably get back to the area until about 4.30 that day. Um, I was wondering, and I don't know if this is with you, um, I would love to personally see the Summit to Place program at some point, and I noticed my spring break does not align with Greendale's. So is that a possibility for board members to go see that in action? Is that something we can do? I think um, we could work to make that happen. I'm kind of looking at doc Dr. Mizik. So it would be like any other school program. So I feel like we can figure out how to make that happen. Okay. Awesome. I'll follow up in the details. But I, I want to thank, um, I, Catherine's obviously not here, but um, for inviting the board to see that because I, you know, I think it is a celebration. 21 years is a long time for any of us. So uh, I don't remember that time in my life anymore, but um, <laughs> but I can say that that is a major accomplishment, and I'm really proud of Greendale that we do um, umbrella all of our students and that um, we we make pathways for each of them. And to hear, um, I actually know Kyle personally to know that he's at his dream job right now. I just saw him the other day, and just just the things that Greendale is doing for all of our students to help them get to that next level is really great. So um, I do want to thank all of you. I don't know if anyone else from the board has anything. Um, this is amazing. Thank you for your time tonight with us. Um, this is such important work that it really was worth it for you guys to end our night tonight. So thank you so much. And um, we wish you the best. All right. Uh, we are going to move on uh, to school board uh, um, professional development. I don't know that we've had any opportunities in the last couple of weeks. Um, anyone? Nothing. Okay. And then legislative update, we'll leave that to Tasha. Oh, yeah, it's just brief. Um, and one we already talked about was the uh, le legislative joint committee um, voted on the four um, approved curriculums, and one is a CKLA, Wit and Wisdom was another one, I think EL Education and Bookworms. And we've adapted one of the four. Um, and then there is a proposal 
um, to change um, like the school start dates. The goal is to provide a clear guidance and additional flexibility when applying for waivers for the start date of your school year. Okay. All right, and then um, board committee updates. Any committee action going on? I don't know if there's park and rec or library or anything. No, we still have a Greenville Education Foundation meeting on Thursday, I think. Okay. Anyone else? The village board meets tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, um, and they would normally have their next meeting on April 2nd, but due to the election, they'll be meeting on April 1st instead, 6 o'clock at village, village Hall. Wow, they usually meet on election night. That's amazing. Okay, um, and then we're going to look at the board calendar review. Um, and Kaya, by the way, thank you for sticking with us. This is Kaya, very um, Kaya, I'm impressed too, Kaya. Especially after the musical, you must be tired. Um, Dr. Mizik, is there anything for our board calendar update, a spring break? As I mentioned in communications, there are district concerts every night this week, uh, 6.30 on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. If you'd like to see the progression of performance music in the district, there are about 45-minute to one-hour concerts. Uh, and then spring break is next week. Awesome. You looking forward to it, Kaya? I'll be getting sleep then. Yeah. <laughs> You're waiting till then, right? Yeah. All right, um, we are on to additional comments or um, questions from visitors. Anyone wishing to speak tonight, come on up. You waited a long time. I might even give you three minutes and 10 seconds. How about that? <laughs> no. You can't do I that. I can't do but. that. I'll get in trouble. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Um, my name is Carol Ann Burroughs. Um, I'm a resident of Greendale. I've lived, we live on Russell Court. We actually own two houses in Greendale, and we've lived here for 12 years. I have four daughters that are in actually all three elementary, um, middle school, and high school. I love Greendale schools. I just want to preface that. Um, I love Greendale, and I feel like the teachers work tirelessly, the school board works tirelessly, and, it, and it's a big job, and it's hard. It's a hard job. Um, I, I do want to stand in support of the woman that spoke today about her, her difficult situation that she's going through in the middle school with her daughter. Um, just, I don't want to speak for her, but I want to share my experience of my perception of the situation with her and just use that as an example because there's been other situations I've, I've noticed the same way. Mm -hmm. I, um, I volunteer a page because I like to be kind of in facing um, difficult situations. That, that's, that's what I like to do because I feel like that's where true growth happens. Mm -hmm. I came to the, the meeting today with some really good news because my daughter had some really good things to say about the Character Strong program, and I was like, this is, this is going really good. Um, so I reported that, and I said, things are going really good. It seems like they're doing a lot. Um, but that mother showed up and said that um, there were many situations where she was not able to um, have her voice heard in some ways, in a lot of ways. and that I, I felt her, I don't want to speak for her, but I felt her pain. I do agree that those things weren't handled proper, properly, and I care about her. I care about the kids that, uh, that are on the opposite side. I care that they are accountable, and I think that they're smart, and they kind of know how to get in situations where they're not going to get in trouble, and I'm just kind of asking, and also volunteering my services if there's anything I can do to help improve these little gaps because it looks like there's lots of good things that are happening but there's a few holes and maybe racism in general needs to be filled up a little bit better um i don't want to be um, negative but at the same time it's okay for me to say maybe not all the issues are being handled properly and that's okay because that's how we grow and that's how we improve and, and and i also would love to be part of the solution but i'm not quite sure how to um, I, I saw Mrs. Ortloff. Um, the, the Just Ask book is amazing. I actually painted part of it on the school. Um, I, I'm very inspired by that, so I would love to be a part of something like that, but more towards other issues, like I said, towards racism and things that maybe need to address, be addressed more directly. And, um, and that's it. <laughs> thank you that for your time. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and thank you. I appreciate your input, and thank you for being with us tonight till the end. Um, anyone else wishing to speak tonight? 
No pressure for anyone. All right, we are on adjournment at the end of our meeting tonight and our, uh, we're gonna be moving into closed session and not returning to open session. So I am looking for a motion. Uh, Mary, were you gonna make that motion or who is uh, it? I can. Would you mind? Oh. Um, so we're gonna be going into closed session. You will not be seeing us back in open session tonight. All right, a motion to close session under Wisconsin statute 19.85 considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, specifically to review teacher non-renewal and compensation. No board action will be taken. Okay, so I'm looking for a second. second. We've got a motion and a second to go into closed session. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. Motion carries. Our next regular board meeting will be on Tuesday, April 8th at 7 p.m. in the Greendale Library. Thank you for all joining us for tonight.